Asmat Guru Bhyarmaha, Asmat Parama Guru Bhyarmaha, Asmat Sarva Guru Bhyarmaha. I offer my respects to all my teachers. Today we are going to start the Charma Sloka Prakaranam of Mumukshapadi by Pila Lokacharya with a commentary by Manamala Mahamuni. We're going to discuss about the Charma Sloka, and particularly there are different Charma Slokas. Um, Charma means the ultimate. Charma Sloka means like the ultimate instruction. So we have, uh, in particular, this Charma Sloka we're going to be discussing is the Charma Sloka of Lord Krishna, which is coming in the Bhagavad Gita, part of the Mahabharata, in the 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, verse 66. Sarva dharman paricaja maam ekam sharanam vaja aham tva sarva pape pyo moksha yishami masu jaha. So this is the third mantra given in the Samashrayana or Pancha Samskara of both schools of Sri Vaishnavism. And uh, it's a very significant mantra. And it is, ex- it is considered to be an expansion of the Dwaya mantra, an expansion of the Tira mantra. So each of these mantras, just like we, when we were discussing in the Tira mantra prakarna, we were discussing that Om Namo Narayanaya is really an expansion of the Omkara. So similarly, so and then the Dwaya mantra being an expansion of the of the uh, Tira mantra, and then the Charma Sloka even being a more expansion of the other two mantras. So each of these mantras has a, has the same meaning, in in a sense, but there are of course details in the meaning in each one of them that uh, that we have to discuss. So let's have a look at the text and let's get started understanding the Charma Sloka. The Charma Sloka. After giving the meaning of the Dwayam, the middle Rahasya. So remember when we were discussing before, when we started the, the, the Dwaya Mantra for Karnam, we were discussing how sometimes people teach the meaning of the Tira, uh, after teaching the meaning of the Tira Mantra, the Tira Stachara Mantra, Omna Monarayanaya, sometimes people teach the Dwaya Mantra, Sri Man Narayana Charanav Sharam Pupadhyashimati Narayana Maha. And then, cha- and then teach the meaning of the Charma Sloka, Krishna Charma Sloka. And then in other times, they teach the Krishna Charma Sloka before they teach the meaning of the Dwaya. So in this case, in the Pati, it's going, the, the order is first the Tira Mantra Prakarnam, then the Dwaya Mantra Prakarnam, then the Charma Sloka Mantra Prakarnam. So here he's, he's saying, when he's referring to the Dwayam, he's talking about the middle Rahasya. The word Rahasya, of course, means secret. That's, and it indicates, uh, of course, uh, many, these mantras are they're now pretty commonly known and understood by everybody. So you can't really call them secrets anymore, especially the Charma Sloka, which is an ordinary, seems like an ordinary verse of the Bhagavad Gita, which is known by everybody. Uh, still, they're called rahasyas because they have secret meanings. They have esoteric meanings or internal meanings that we should understand. So here, the, the middle rahasya is called the Dwaya, Dwaya Mantra because he's being taught in that, in that order. So after giving the meaning of the Dwaya Mantra, the middle rahasya, he reveals the meaning of the Charma Sloka, the last rahasya, in this order. This mantra is the essence of the Gita Upanishad. Now, the Bhagavad Gita is uh, Shmiti. It's coming in the in an Itihasa. An Itihasa is uh, like a history. There are two Itihasas or epic histories uh, in Indian literature, and they are the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. And the Mahabharata. In the Mahabharata, there are many many stories, and uh, but specifically, the Mahabharata is about the uh, Lord Krishna and the five Pandavas, five hundred Pandava brothers, and uh, so the story of the Bhagavad Gita, we all know, is that uh, Lord Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna as a series of instructions when he was bewildered on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, not knowing whether to fight or not to fight. So um, 
this that that is 18 there's 18 chapters of, uh, of this conversation between Krishna and Arjuna and in the very last chapter we should we can say the ultimate chapter right we get the ultimate verse the ultimate verse is uh, verse 66 now uh, and then the Gita ends after a few more verses so um, the Gita is also called Gita Upanishad because in the Gita Mahatman it says Sarva Upanishado Gavo Dogda Gopal and that Gopal or Lord Krishna is just like a cowherd. And of course, the stories of Lord Krishna is that he was brought up in a cowherd um, community, being hidden away from uh, from the Chatri community that he was born in in uh, in, uh, in Mathura because of his uh, demoniac uncle Kamsa, who wanted to kill him. So he was hidden away in a cowherd community, a Vaishya community of Nanda Maharaj and Yasoda, uh, who were his foster parents. And therefore he used to engage in, in this uh, tending to the cows. So in this, in this sloka, which is a, a glorification of the Bhagavad Gita, it says that the Upanishads, all of the Upanishads and their knowledge from the Vedas, the Upanishads, of course, are the philosophical part of the Vedas, but all of the Upanishads, they can be distilled down, they can be distilled down to the essence, which is the Bhagavad Gita. So in this case, in this sense, the Bhagavad Gita here is called an Upanishad. So it says, Sarva Upanishad Gavo, that all the Upanishads are like a herd of cows. And Lord Krishna tends these cows and uh, he milks the cows. Uh, and uh, the milk that he gets from this herd of cows is the nectar of the Bhagavad Gita. So the Gita is like the essence or the milk coming from the cows, which are the Upanishads. So it is called Gita Upanishad. And uh, it's considered to be the essence of the Upanishads. Strictly speaking, the Upanishads are Vedic, Vedic uh, books. And uh, so they are called Shruti, and uh, the the uh, itihasas like Mahabharata and the Bhagavad Gita are called Shmiti. So there's a there's a, a technical distinction between these two types of scriptures. But the Gita is such a great scripture that it is that it is given this title of Upanishad. It's considered to be just as great as uh, these Upanishads or these. These uh, Shrutis, Shruti scriptures. So we also we also say Nigama and Agama. Nigama means uh, Vedas, and Agama means non-Vedas, non-Vedic uh, scriptures. Okay, so here, so that's why here it's called Gita Upanishad, and the word Gita itself um, is short for Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavan, of course, means God, and Gita means song. So it means the song of God, literally. So this mantra that we're talking about here, the Charma Sloka, is the essence of the Bhagavad Gita, which itself is the essence of the Upanishads. So a very, very important mantra. Just like we, just like we discussed and we say that the, the Gayatri Mantra or the Omkara, these are the essence of the, Gita, of the Vedas. Similarly, the Bhagavad Gita is considered the essence of the Vedas, the essence of the Upanishads, and the, and the Charma Sloka is the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. So this mantra is the essence of the Gita Upanishad, which is the essence of the fifth Veda, the Mahabharata. And why does he call the, the Mahabharata the fifth Veda? Because the Mahabharata includes the Bhagavad Gita, and the Bhagavad Gita is the essence of the Upanishads, or the Vedas. Therefore, it's considered just like a fifth Veda. Now, on the level of pramana, or the level of scriptural proof, we accept the Vedas as being what we call Swata Pramana. Swata Pramana means self-evident proof there is no need for any other proof to back it up whereas when we get when we get quotations from shmiti or from from non-vedic sources we like to get other <laughs> other quotations to back up those quotations and we also cannot accept certain things that come in itihasas puranas and other um, scriptures of lower hierarchy in proof, if they contradict the Swata Pramana or the self, the self-proclaimed or the self, the self-proved uh, proofs of proofs of the Shruti. 
So that's a, the difference in understanding in philosophy, in, Vedic, in Vedanta philosophy is that the, whatever is there in the Vedas has to be accepted. Um, if there's some contradiction there between statements in the Vedas or Swata Pramana, then we have to rationalize, we have to understand by logic and, uh, and uh, uh, argumentation and understanding the, how we can rationalize uh, the meaning, just like uh, Adi Shankaracharya, he looks at the, at the Upanishads and he sees all, only oneness, and Madhva looks and sees only dual duality. Uh, whereas Ramana just sees the, not only the Beta Shrutis and the Abeda Shrutis, but he sees the Gatika Shrutis. He sees he sees not only the texts which deal with 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 difference and those that deal with oneness, but also those that deal with both oneness and difference, and he reconciles them all. So we have, we have to reconcile statements within the Vedas, within the Svata Pramana, within the highest, the highest proof of the Vedas. Whereas those that are not in the Vedas, those that are coming from sources outside of the Vedas, not, we, we can sometimes rationalize them to mean the same as what is in the Vedas. But sometimes if there's a conflict, we can reject them also. We can reject them because they're not, because they're not of such a high caliber of, of proof. Like that. So here, though, the Mahabharata is considering such a significant scripture that some people call it the fifth Veda. So it's just like the Vedas, it's considered a fifth Veda. Now, uh, of course, uh, purely, from a, purely from a standpoint of hierarchy of, of, um, of scriptural proof, Although it's considered the fifth Veda, still the Shruti is considered Swata Pramana and the Mahabharata is still considered to be Shmriti. But it is praised, it is praised as being just like a fifth Veda. So it can be seen that the Charma Sloka, or the last verse, or excuse me, the ultimate instruction of Lord Krishna in the, in the Bhagavad Gita. Is a further explanation of the Dwaya Mantra. Okay, so it's like an expansion of the Dwaya Mantra. And by the way, so we have, first of all, the Astakshara Mantra is eight syllables long. The Dwaya Mantra, Sri Mandaraya Nachada No Shada Nam Prapadye Sri Mate Naraya Naraya right, is 26 syllables long. And then further, we have the, the Charma Sloka, which is an Anastut Sloka, which is a normal uh, um, type of uh, verse that we find, the most common type of verse, Anastut, which has four lines or four quarters or two and two halves of eight and 16 syllables respectively. So we have a total of 32 syllables. So, so they're, each of them are longer than, than the other in, in syllable length. So it can be seen that the Charma Sloka is a further explanation of the Dwyer. In its first line, Lord Krishna himself enjoins the choosing of the Upaya, which is stated, the Upaya or the means to liberation. So Lord Krishna is, is, is enjoining us to take up the Upaya of property, right? The Upaya, which is stated in the first line of the Dwyam. So what was the... What was, the, what was the Upaya stated in the first line of the Dwayam? So let's look back in our, uh, for a second. Sri Narayana Charano Sharanam It means I take shelter at the feet of Sri Narayana, of, of Sri Narayana, associated with Goddess Lakshmi, Sri Devi. So surrender unto the feet of the holy feet of the Lord, which is property or Sharanagati. So that is the upaya, that is the means which is suggested in the first part of the Dwaya Mantra. Remember that the Dwaya Mantra, if you remember in our last sessions, the Dwaya Mantra consists of two parts. The first part giving the means and the second part speaking about the goal. Now the means and the goal in Sri Vaishnavism is the same. The means is Sri Manarayana and the goal is Sri Manarayana or, ser or specifically service to Sri Manarayana. So the means is taking shelter of Sri Manarayana the goal is service to Sri Manarayana eternally in Sri Bhakti. Okay, so therefore, the first part, the first line of the 
Charma Sloka, Sarva Dharman Parityaja. Parityaja, Tyaj means to abandon or to get rid of. Parityaj, Pari, the word Pari is a, Pari is a suffix that goes, there are 20, about 21, I think, 21 suffixes in, in, in Sanskrit. And they, and they, they, they change the meaning of a verb, verbal suffixes. suffixes. So Parityaj, means to completely abandon, completely abandon. Um, and Sarva Dharman means, Sarva means all, and Dharman means Dharmas. Now, what Dharmas mean exactly? What is the exact meaning of Dharmas? Uh, that we have to discuss in some more detail. But Dharma usually means religiosity or means, uh, um, or, you know, auspicious religious um, acts. Or, Sarva Dharma Paritaja. In this case, of course, it means uh, it can it can be understood to mean several things. So we'll we'll discuss it when we get to it. Like that. Okay. So um, so in the first line of the Charma Sloka, Lord Krishna is saying to, to abandon other methods, abandon other upayas. Yeah. Other upayas, there are other upayas than surrender, than property, right? So we know this we, from our study of Arthapanchika, from our study elsewhere. We know that there are other means that the Krishna preaches that we hear in the scriptures to liberation. There are other means than simply surrender unto the feet of the Lord, right? So there's karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga. Right, even in Archipanchika, they, they give uh, this uh, Acharya Abhimana as, a, as an ultimate surrender, form of surrender, surrender to the Acharya. But here he's talking about surrender to, to him or making him the, the, the means to liberation, property. And so he's saying, Sarva Dharma Paritaja, all these other, other methods, give up all these other methods, right? And that's the, that's the first sentence. So, in its first line, the Lord himself enjoins the choosing of an apaya, which is stated in the first phrase of the Dwayam. This first line of the Charma Sloka literally explains, number one, what the choosing of the apaya is aimed at, and number two, that relinquishing other sadhanas, right, or dharmas, right, is the ancillary anga of such choosing, and number three, that this choosing is devoid of any thought that it is a sadhana, right? Because obviously if you're giving up all, all sadhanas or all dharmas, right? So the word sadhana means, comes from the word sat, sat means eternal, but those, those things which lead to eternality or liberation, those are sadhanas, right? But upayas, we can say upayas, but sadhanas usually refers to a course of action that somebody takes and different things that the person performs in order to achieve the goal of liberation or some or whatever spiritual goal the person is trying for. So, again, uh, the first line of the Charma Sokka literally exp explains, number one, what the choosing of the Upaya is aimed at, what the choosing of the, of, of the Lord as sur surrendered to the Lord is, Right, that relishing other, that relinquishing other sadhanas is an ancillary or anga of such choosing, and that this choosing is devoid of any thought that it is a sadhana in itself. Furthermore, the Charma Sloka's second line literally explains the deliverance from all sin, which obstructs the final attainment. We understand this also from our study of other books like Artapanchika, that there are what we call virodis. There are things which are obs obstruct us from reaching the goal. So we may know what the goal is. We may adopt a, a, uh, a means to attain the goal, right? But there are still obstructions to obtaining the goal. So what are those obstructions? The obstructions that Arjuna was worried about, he was worried about the heap of sins, the burden of sins that he has from living unlimited lives in this material world and having performed any, every sinful and biased activity and having those 
karmas, those uh, reactions to those sinful and pious activities attached to him, to his soul, and therefore stopping him from achieving liberation. So that's what he was worried about. So the second line in the Charma Sloka explains that this explains that this uh, there will be deliverance, right? Upon accepting the first line, which is the method of reaching liberation, the Upaya, the Supreme Lord, or surrender to the Supreme Lord, that that we shouldn't worry about the obstacles. The, what are the obstacles? The obstacles are those karmas from sins and 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 pious activities that we perform, right? Are literally our karma, our accumulated karma, right? And therefore, the second line says, so first line, Sarvadhamam Pritita. Second line, Mam Ekam Sharanam Vraja Aham Tva Sarvapape Byo. So in this case, when they're talking about lines here, I think they're talking about the first two quarters and the second two quarters because Sarvapape Byo Mokshi Yishami comes in the third quarter or the, or the first part of the second line of the sloka. So as furthermore, the Charma Sloka second line literally explains the deliverance from all sins which obstruct the final attainment, the moksha. This deliverance is what precedes the service, Haimkarya, referred to in the last sentence of the Dwaya. So again, the last sentence of the Dwaya talks about the goal, the first sentence, the, the means, the second sentence, the goal. And the goal is, of course, the, the, the eternal service of the Lord, or Haimkarya, in Sri Vaikuntha. This deliverance is what precedes the, the kind career. So, so the deliverance from sins. Sarva pape bio moksha yishami. Relieving, I will give you moksha, right? Or I will free you from the burden of all sins. Um, and here, then, okay, so continuing on. Indeed, it was in order to hear the meaning of this mantra, right? So there's some exact dispute about this particular um, sentence here. So she says, uh, indeed is to hear the, the meaning, the esoteric meaning of this mantra that Ramanuja approached Tirukoti or Nambi 18 times. So Ramanuja, after taking Samashrayanam or Panchasamskara from Periyanambi or Mahapurna, who was a disciple of Yamunacharya, who couldn't directly take uh, initiation from Yamunacharya or Alavanda, Although Alavanda wanted to give him initiation, but uh, he, previously he was in the group call of another person called Yadava Prakash, who was in fact a beta beta Vardin. He was not a Vaishnava. He was a follower of a school, a particular school of beta beta Vard, right? Of which Ramanuja disagreed with. And uh, after coming out from that guru call and that teacher, uh, and disagreeing with that teacher, and he came to the point where he wanted to approach Yamunacharya, but at that time, Yamunacharya had passed away. So the system is that uh, if, if you want to take initiation from a, in a particular lineage and the head of the lineage or that particular Acharya that you choose passes away, then you should choose one of the disciples of that Acharya and you should take uh, the Panchasamskara or the ritual initiation the ritual form, form external form of, of, of Sharnagati or property from the next people, the, the disciples of that, one of the disciples of that Acharya. So Yamunacharya had several disciples. Ramanuja took initiation or Panchasamskara from, from, uh, from Mahapurna, Perinambi. And uh, each one of these Acharyas, of course, in Sri Vaishnavas and many of the people, everybody has a Sanskrit form of their name and a Tamil form of their name. So his name was Mahapurna Sanskrit and Perinambi Tamil, and uh, which basically mean the same thing. So Maha means great, Peri means great. So in those diff different languages. So Ramanuja took that initiation from him, but then he wanted a deeper understanding of the esoteric nature of the, of the particular mantras that he'd been given. So he approached this Tirukoti or Nambi, also called um, Ghosty Purna, 
in uh, uh, to uh, to Kofi on Nambi was the Tamil is his Tamil name, Gosti Puna was the Sanskrit name, who lived in a place called Tirukotiyo, which is near to Sri Rangam. And so Ramanuja went from Sri Rangam to that place 18 times to try and uh, appeal to that Acharya to give him the internal esoteric meaning of the different mantras like that. So, of course, there's a very famous story that uh, uh, after the 18th time, the Acharya relented and gave him the secret meaning of the Tira Mantra and uh, it's told him you should not reveal the Tira Mantra to anybody and Ramanuja revealed the Tira Mantra by getting up on top of the temple tower of Gopuram and shouting it out to everybody who could hear. But here, what she's saying is she's saying specifically that Ramanuja went to uh, Tirukoti Anambi to get the esoteric meaning of this mantra, the Charama Sloka. So different, different sections of Sri Vaishnava society, the Northern School, the Southern School, and other sections, they may have a slightly different story about this in Ramanuja's life, um, exactly, exactly what happened. But in, in any case, we can say Ramanuja went to Tirukoti Anambi to get esoteric meanings of the Diksha mantras that he received in Panchasamskara from Kheri Nambi of Mahapuna. So why he had to go 18 times, that's another whole story. We won't go into that here, but he went many, many times and, uh, and showed that he was sincere by continuously approaching the guru and uh, not giving up until he got the answers that he requested. So Nambi, and the word Nambi in, uh, here, it's, uh, here it's written Nampi, because the transliteration that she uses here is a scholarly transliteration of uh, Tamil, uh, which is called ISO 15919. And in that, the letters P and B are synonymous. They're the same because in Tamil, there's only one letter which represents the sounds in, that we have in other languages, P and B. So um, we can say Nambi or we can say Nampi. It's the same thing in Tamil. Okay, so Nambi means in Tamil, a respectable person. So a respectable person is given this uh, appellation or this nomenclature, or this name, Nambi. So Nambi, meaning, to refer to your Nambi, right? Recognizing the difficulty in its meaning and the lack of people who are qualified for it, exhausted Ramanuja by making him come back many, many times, right? So in fact, he had, had him come back 17 times and only on the 18th time did he agree. It's interesting that there are 18 chapters in Bhagavad Gita and the, on the 18th time, he was given the, he was given the, uh, the essence of, the, the, of, of all these mantras, including the mantra from the 18th chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, exhausted Ramanuja by making him come back many, many times, taking take vows, fast for a month, uh, all in order to test his faith and zeal. Okay, so there are many stories about what Ramanuja had to go through to get knowledge from this teacher. Only after thus impressing on him its rare value did Nambi finally reveal it to him. Okay, so one must... Number one, be firmly established in the purest piety, nishkristya, nishkrista, sattva nishta. Right? Sattva nishta means fixed in sattva guna, right? Or the mode of goodness. Be firmly established in, pure, in purest piety. Number two, delight only in the paramatman, in the Lord within the soul, the, the Lord within the body, the antaryami. Right, the super soul. Three, have aversion to all other than him. Right, so one has to be completely pure. One has to be uh, strongly and uh, strongly attached to um, in, to to meditation on the super soul, and have an aversion to other things, to other other personalities apart from him. Right. Uh, be, and then number four, be, obedient, be an obedient follower of the scriptures, goes without saying, of the rules in the scriptures, right? And five, upon hearing the Lord's greatness, have abundant faith that it's true. And number six, 
be a foremost believer. Okay, so I'm not sure exactly where she gets this uh, this from. It may be, I'm not sure exactly. All right. So only a person like this is qualified to hear the meaning of this sloka. Okay, so are we all, are we all of this caliber? You know, it's the, in the beginning of this chapter. Uh, it's being stated here, the qualifications for understanding the esoteric meaning of this, of this mantra. So we have to ask, are, are we all ready for this? So I have seen these qualifications, I would say, if these are prerequisites, I certainly am not, not ready. So, um, but anyway, let's, let's continue on, right? Only a person like this is qualified to hear the meaning of this sloka and practice it. Thus, it's very hard to find those who are qualified for it for this reason because, and because of the venerable importance, Gaurava, of its meaning. Uh, Ramanuja's predecessors had kept it secret without making it public. Now, even in the Bhagavad Gita, we have this statement by Lord Krishna, Raja Vidya Raja Gukhyam. So he says in the, I believe, ninth chapter, beginning of the ninth chapter, he says, of Bhagavad Gita, he says, this is the greatest knowledge, Raja Vidya. And Vidya also reminds us that the Upanishadic methods to reach Brahman or to reach Moksha are called Vidyas. They're certain knowledges, esoteric knowledges, or the, or the knowledge of esoteric means uh, to, to attain lok, moksha or liberation. These are called vidyas. So, Raja Vidya, this is the king of all, of all uh, Raja Vid's king. Raja Vidya is the king of all knowledges. And Raja Guhyam, the word Guhyam means uh, sometimes it, in, in Hindi, modern Hindi, it means a cave, but that's a secret place, right? So, Guhyam in Sanskrit means a secret, a secret. So Raja Vidya, it's, this, it's, the, it's the king of all knowledges and the king of all secrets. And yet, that secret is known to everybody. Everybody knows the Mahabharata, everybody knows the Bhagavad Gita, and everybody knows the, the, the Charma Sloka. Everybody, if you can ask all Vaishnavas, all practically all Hindus, you ask them what the Sarvadam and Pritidam where does that come from? Everybody knows. Everybody knows where it comes from, but not everybody knows the meaning the internal meaning, the esoteric meanings of the, of the mantra. All right. So we find that even, even the Tira mantra, even the Dwaya mantra, even the Charma Soka, all of these mantras, which are given in uh, initiation in the Panchasamskara, right, by the Acharyas and Sri Vaishnava school, uh, school of Philosophy, they are very, they're quite common and people know them, but people don't know. What people don't know is they don't know in general, they don't know the esoteric meaning of them. Right. So these Rahasya Granthas, like uh, of Vedanta Deshika, he wrote his Rahasyas, he wrote his books of esoteric knowledge, of esoteric meaning of these mantras. And the, the Southern School Acharyas, uh, Pilot Acharya and Vedanta, uh, and uh, excuse me, and Manavala Mamani, they also wrote their commentaries on these mantras. So there's a vast amount of literature uh, on the esoteric meaning of this mantra, right? And at a certain point in Sri Vaishnava history, there was no, none of this literature because it was secret. It was totally secret. It was never written down and it was passed from a guru to a disciple. And sometimes the guru, would, would test the disciple and wouldn't even give to all his disciples, but only to those he felt were most qualified. In fact, there are times in the lineage where this knowledge has been passed down from a guru to only one person, to one disciple. So at a certain point, and, that, and even then by verbally, orally, never written down because it's a secret. So we are so, so grateful and so, so happy that we have these things written down for us today and, and, and published and printed en masse. Uh, in, the, in those days, even, even when they began to write down these esoteric meanings, 
they wrote them on palm leaves and they had to be copied out by hand. That also limits the spread of this knowledge. So with the coming of the printing press, of course, and with modern digital technology, we can spread the, this knowledge unlimitedly. But in the beginning, the Acharyas felt that these things should be kept quite secret and they shouldn't be given to people who were not qualified. And that's why she has been mentioned here. These are the actual qualifications understood at the time of Ramanuja, right? By Tirukoti or Nambi, right? Gosi Purna. Of the person who can be impart, who can have these uh, secrets imparted to them. Nowadays, we're imparting these to everybody. These secrets. So that's uh, an interesting sort of change and evolution in the in the uh, in the society of Sri Vaishnava, the Sri Vaishnava society. Still, even up even up until fifty or hundred years ago, you would find that. Uh, people in the Sri Vaishnava Sampradaya would be very reticent. They would be very um, standoffish about, about discussing these, these esoteric secrets with anybody, especially people who are not initiated. Imaginely, imagine in those days, even the people who were initiated into these mantras by an Acharya, the Acharya would pick and choose and not necessarily give th these esoteric meanings to every disciple. Today, even those people who are not formally initiated, they're learning these secrets. They're, 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 they're being, these secrets are being opened by, by mass book distribution and all these sort of things. So just see. But this is also in the spirit of Ramanuja. Because Ramanuja, so that is, that, that's interesting. Because, so for instance, when we look at Acharyas in, uh, in India, we, we look in the Vedas and we look in the... Uh, in the scriptures, we see that the guru is supposed to test this, these disciples. It's supposed, the teacher is supposed to test the student and only reveal um, certain, certain esoteric meanings to, to a qualified student, right? So up until the time of Ramanuja, you can see Gosti Purna, he was testing Ramanuja. And Ramanuja was certainly very qualified. And yet he made him come back 17 times before imparting this particular knowledge to him. So what to speak of us today, who are not even as qualified, we can't, we can't say that we're as qualified as Ramanuja. So are we qualified to, to hear this esoteric, these esoteric teachings? That is the greatness of Ramanuja, because Ramanuja, when after Ramanuja came, Acharyas completely changed. The Acharyas or the Gurus before Ramanuja, they used to very strictly follow what was stated in the scriptures that you must test very strongly each and every student and, and impart to them only that knowledge which that student is able to understand. And, and, and it all has to be done in a very secret, secret manner, right? So after Ramanuja, there was a more liberal, there was definitely a more liberal um, a more liberal way of looking at these things. Ramanuja set the tone by, by climbing the temple tower and, and spreading the knowledge freely to everybody. So now we find that following in his footsteps, we can not only receive this knowledge, even though we're not qualified to, to hear it, and we can also spread this knowledge even though we're not qualified to spread it. So following in the footsteps of Sripad Ramanuja, we can do this. So that he's given us that example. But as I said, even amongst uh, Sri Vaishnavas up to a gen few generations ago, this, it would be very, very difficult to talk about these matters. Uh, I, I, can, I can imagine when I first came in contact with uh, Sri Vaishnavas in India, I can just imagine asking someone like Dr. Alwar, please, Please uh, teach Mamukshapati to us. Please teach us the secret meanings of the of the of the three mantras, the three gems of initiation. And uh, I can very much tell you that probably in the in those days, in the sixties and seventies, there would be a no. I'm sorry, you're not qualified for these things. But today, you know, we find that. This is a much more open system. Okay, so anyway, getting on, that's the point.
So, but Ramanuja's overwhelming compassion made him unable to bear seeing the distress of those in samsara. So out of compassion, Ramanuja is giving us all of these esoteric meanings. Thus, regardless of the precariousness, excuse me, regard, regardless of the preciousness, the preciousness of the Charma Sloka's meaning, when he saw their suffering, he publicized it. So here we have the, uh, here we have an anecdote. Uh, there's a footnote here, and the footnote says, this anecdote may be compared with the Guru Prampara Prabhavam 6000. Okay, so there's a, there's a book called Guru Prampara Prabhavam. So it's a book about the Guru Prampara and about the lives and teachings of all the, the gurus in the lineage. The word Prampara, Guru means teacher, and Prampara means one after another. So the Prabhavam of that, the, the, the story of that, is given in 6,000 verses. And uh, the edition that she quotes here is an edition published by S. Krishnaswami Iyengar, who was a, an Acharya who used to live in Trichy, is no more now, uh, 1975, just near to Sri Ramam, um, pages 193 to 194, in which he tells how Ramanuja approached Tirukoti and Nambi 18 times, but says that it was the meaning of Tira Mantra. You see, in the group Rampara Prabhavam, that's what I told you, different people have different ideas of this story, uh, is the meaning of the Tira Mantra that he learned from him and then proclaimed from the temple tower in Tirukoti, right? The Ramanuja climbed the Gopuram or the temple tower and he shouted out the meaning and the, it gave out the Tira Mantra to everyone. After Nambi saw Ramanuja's compassion for others, he decided to teach him the meaning of the Charma Sloka as well. So this is the, this is the story given by Krishna Swami, S. Krishna Swami Ayanguri of Trichy in his edition of Guru Prampara Prabhupada 6000. Okay, so now not only did uh, Pilalokacharya teach it orally, in the way Ramanuja did, but out of his supreme compassion, he wanted everyone to, to know the meaning of the Charma Sloka, and not only the Charma Sloka, but the Tira uh, Mantra and the Gwaya Mantra, and as, as did Vedanta Deshika, who was a younger contemporary of Pila Lokacharya, right? They all, that, these Acharyas at that time wanted to write, write it all down and, and, and have it saved. So therefore, he revealed the same meaning both concisely and elaborately in many books. Yes, so Pillar Like a Try wrote 18 Rahasis, 18 books, in which he describes the meaning. These are called esoteric, books of esoteric knowledge or Rahasya Grantis. But unlike all these other works, in this book, it is clearly presented such that even women and children can study it. Right. Okay. So this may sound. This sentence may sound a little derogatory. Um, that why, especially why women should be considered lesser students than men. But we have to remember that in those days, of course, uh, and in many societies, um, uh, the women were engaged in household affairs more, household work more, and perhaps they were more, there was more illiteracy amongst the women. And so, so the tendency was for the men in those societies to be, of course, there are many illiterate men also, there are many uneducated men also, but the, 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 the vast majority of the educated people were men in those societies. So here we're talking about even they could be understood by women and children. So let's even they could be understood by people of lesser uh, intellectual prowess or education. Okay. So he's so they, so she's saying here that 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 here in in this particular book for Mukshapati, uh, Pila Lokachari is going to give us the meaning of Charma Sloka, and he's going to give it to us in a very simple way. So as we go through this meaning of Charma Sloka, we should understand that Pila Lokacharya is giving it in a very simple way. There might be some other books, there might be some other Acharyas who have given 
in a very complicated way. But here, Philip Petraeus is going to have mercy on us, and he's going to give it to us in a very simple way. So in the beginning, to impress on everyone's heart the importance of the Charma Sloka, Charma Sloka's meaning, he presents the reasons why it bears the holy name Charma Sloka. So there's no need for us to go into uh, the, the question that we had at the beginning of the Dwaya Prakarnam when, uh, um, when we started understanding the meaning of the Dwaya Mantra was whether we should, whether we should after the Tira Mantra, whether we should, uh, everybody seems to agree that you, you teach the meaning, the esoteric meaning of the Tira Mantra first. But, but there's a disagreement as to whether we teach the Charma Sloka after the Tira Mantra or whether we ch chant, uh, teach the meaning of the Dwaya Mantra after the, the, tira, the Astakra Mantra, the Tira Mantra. So we got through that. We, we discussed that at the beginning of the Dwaya Mantra, Prakarna. Here, there's no need to discuss that because we've already studied the, the Dwaya Mantra. So there's no, there's no need to discuss that order business anymore. So we're going to go straight to the Charma Sloka, but the, but the first thing, the first issue that comes up, right, is going to be, why do we call it Charma Sloka? Why do we, why do we give it this title, the ultimate or the final order of Lord Krishna? Uh, so the first sutra here is Sutra 185. Previously, several replies have been taught. Considering how they are difficult and opposed to the soul's essential nature, Swarupa, Arjuna was stricken with grief. To remove his grief, Krishna revealed to him this last or final charama upaya, or uh, final method, final means, final means. Now, okay, we've heard this word charama upaya or charama upaya before. And sometimes charamopaya, or the last means, or the final means, refers to Acharya Abhimana, which we've discussed in, uh, in uh, Arta Panchika and in other places, uh, meaning, meaning uh, Acharya Bhakti or, or surrender to the Acharya or Acharya property, uh, to uh, uh, surrendering to the teacher as being the final, as the final means. But here, when he uses the word charamopaya here, he means property to God. He means the he means surrender to God or sharanagati. Okay, so we shouldn't misunderstand because this this uh, charamopaya is used. This term is used in, in different places to mean slightly different things. Okay, so here it means the surrender to the supreme Lord or property, which is such that there is nothing beyond this. Therefore, it bears the name. Charma Sloka. Okay, so here's the first, this is the first sutra, right? Uh, this is the first sutra. And uh, did we have any, I don't think we had any other footnotes so far. No. Okay. So let's continue on. In the many chapters of the Bhagavad Gita prior to this sloka or prior to this verse, Lord Krishna, Krishna has elabor had elaborated uh, had, had elaborately revealed several different upayas, karma yoga, jnana yoga, even bhakti yoga, etc. As sadhanas to moksha, as methods, uh, as upayas or means to moksha, to liberation, right, and attainment of himself. Arjuna, his student, right, realized that they were impossible to perform because of the physical exertion they demanded, number one, the difficulty of controlling the senses, number two, and the necessity for performing these upayas assiduously for a long time, meaning that you have to perform Kami Yoga, Gyan Yoga, Bhakti Yuga for a long time, and they have to be done assiduously. They have to be done perfectly for them to bear fruit. So these are these three, three problems with these other upayas, that they demand a lot of effort, right, then there's the difficulty of controlling the senses while doing them, and they have to be done perfectly over a long period of time. And by a long period of time can also mean several lifetimes, not just in this lifetime. So he also realized that since 
they involve self-efforts, right? They involve self-effort. Each one of them involves self-effort. That means the individual has to perform, has, has to perform them and has to put in a lot of effort. That means if there's effort, that they're dependent upon the nature of the soul, meaning that, 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 that there's a qualification that each person has to have that he has to be able to perform them. If I tell you to do something, but you don't know how to do it, if I say drive the car from here to there, but you don't know how to drive a car, then you're not qualified for that, for that means. So they, they were obstacles to the dependent nature of the soul. Okay, so remember we were discussing this. This is especially true uh, according to the Southern School of Relations and the Tengalais. They understand that the soul being completely dependent on God. What is the true nature of the soul? The true nature of the soul is being completely subservient, controlled, and, and, and dependent upon God. Supported, controlled, dependent totally on God. Like we are an object. Like being an insentient being that was described before. Like, like being an object. God's, God's, uh, God's property. Right? We're completely dependent upon him. So... That complete dependence on him means that we're not dependent on others, including ourselves. Including ourselves. We're not dependent on any others. We're also not dependent on ourselves. So if we say that the person must perform a, du a, a, a duty or perform a particular means, which is dependent upon his own qualifications, therefore he is dependent upon himself. So that self-dependence stands as that idea of self-dependence, and we've discussed this before, what do we call self-dependence or self, uh, self de depending on others, depending on, uh, on ourself, it's called ahankar and mamakar. Ahankar means false ego, thinking that I can do something or thinking that others, uh, that I need the help of others, apart from the Supreme Lord, he says, also a form of ahankar and mamakar. So even though People who perform karma yoga, jnana yoga, and bhakti yoga, they feel like they're being selfless. They're not actually being totally, absolutely, 100% selfless. They're still insisting that it is they that have the qualification, they that perform the particular specific effort put in to, uh, to achieve the goal. So as long as we have that slight tinge of ahankara and mamakara, or egoness, iness, and minus, right, there, that is against, the, the Tengala Acharyas especially say, the Southern School Acharyas especially say, that that is against the true nature, the absolute true nature of the soul as being 100% totally dependent on the Lord. If we are 100% totally dependent on the Lord, we are not even 1% dependent on ourselves or anything else. Right. If we are not dependent 100, at least even 1% on ourselves, then that means that no self-effort can save us. So in this sense, the Tengal Acharyas, the Sri Vaishnava Acharyas of the Southern School especially, say that these other forms will not lead to moksha because they still involve that slight amount of ahankara and mamakara. So we, we call them adharma. We call them irreligion. We call them the wrong methods. We, we, we reject them. We reject those methods. Whereas the northern school of Sri Vaishnavas, the followers of Vilanti Deshika in the Deshika, what's called Deshika Sampradaya or the Wadigalai school, Sri Vaishnavism, they will say, yes, property is a way. And even Pillar Lokacharya in his uh, Agda Panchika, he says, Karma yoga is a way, jnana yoga is a way, bhakti yoga is a way. These are all ways. These are all methods like that. But ultimately, when you get down to it, when you get down to the esoteric essence, that, that's a very general statement that there are these five ways. But ultimately, Pilar Lokacharya, what he's saying here, and Malavala Muni, is that these are not ways. These are actually really not ways. They have to be rejected. Only property has to be accepted. Property is the only way because everything else goes against our total dependence on the Lord, which is our real true nature. Right? So even the Gaudi Vaishnavas, they say, 
Jiva Swarupoi Nichi Krishna Das. You are eternally a servant of Krishna, and that's what you should uh, understand, and that's what you should uh, meditate on, and that's what you should should um, should should understand. Yes. So if you're if you're a servant of Krishna, then what does that mean? That you're not a servant of anyone else. That you're not reliant on anyone else. You're totally reliant on Krishna. So if you're not reliant on anyone else, you're also not reliant on yourself. You can't say I'm a servant of Krishna, but I'm not a servant of Shiva. I'm not a ser- I'm not reliant on Shiva or Brahma or, or these gods. I'm not reliant on my family. I'm not reliant on my nation. I'm not reliant on anything else in this material world. But somehow, or other, right? I have to have the qualification, and I have to do the. I have to make the effort to reach God. No, you can't say those two things together, and say that you're completely selfless. If you're completely selfless, if you're completely understanding your true 100% dependence on God, then you can't say that you're dependent on yourself even 1%, even a fraction of 1%. Even infinitesimally, you are not dependent on yourself. You're completely and absolutely dependent on the Lord only. That's it. That is your true nature. And only by understanding that, we have true property, real property. That is real property. So, so all of these other things involve self-effort. Self-efforts involve a, a small, a tiny piece of self-ego, of ego. So he also realized that since they involve self-efforts, right, they were obstacles to the dependent nature of the soul. Very important. Declared to be the Lord's own body. The care to be the Lord's own body. The soul is what? The soul, all the souls together, and the insentience, the chit and achit, right? The the everything else but God, everything else but God, everything else but the Supreme Lord is chit achit and Ishra. Ishra is the Supreme Lord, everything else is chit achit. This material universe, the souls, everything, everything is the body of God. Everything is the body of God. The body is completely controlled and supported and, and owned by the soul. So if we are truly to act in our original nature, in our, in our essential nature, in our svarupa, right, we have to give up all ahankara, all mamakara, all egoness, all, all absolutely every, every shred of egoness, every shred of, of inus and minus. So Arjuna was pierced with grief, thinking, I can't be that one. I, it can't be. It can't be that one can attain our Lord with these, with these problems, right? With these disqualifications. Alas, I have lost him forever. So this is uh, what, you know, she's paraphrasing here, and she's saying this is what Arjuna was thinking. Arjuna was dejected. In the beginning of the Gita, he was dejected. He didn't know what to do. He didn't know who to approach. He didn't know what what Lord Krishna says. You're acting like a fool. You're acting like a a crazy man. That you're you 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 know you're you're mourning for what shouldn't be mourned for. The living and the dead. You know the soul is imperishable. Like that. He he starts out by telling him that. But even in the end, uh, Arjuna is still morose. He's still he's still thinking. That I that I cannot I can't qualify for anything, and then Lord Krishna gives him the ultimate, the ultimate uh, method, the ultimate means, or property for attaining him. In order to remove his grief, in order to remove the grief of of Arjuna. Now you would think after hearing about karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, right, all these other uh, methods. That, that Arjuna would be satisfied, but he was not satisfied. Even after hearing all of those, he still had grief. So in order to relieve that grief, Lord Krishna revealed the ultimate upaya or the final upaya, the final means, the ultimate means, which is very easy to do. It's very easy to do because what there is no doing of it. We're not doing it. It's not being done by us. If we think we're doing something, then again, there's a hunkara, there's mamakara there, there's a hunkara. 
there's a false ego, in accord with the soul's essential nature and is unsurpassed. So that is why, hence it has received the holy name, Charama Sloka. So because the means taught in this final verse or final instruction of Lord Krishna's in the Bhagavad Gita is the final, most essential to the, to, to the, to, to the nature of the soul and unsurpassed, right, means to liberation. That is why everybody calls it the Charama Sloka, the ultimate sloka, the ultimate verse, because it teaches the ultimate upaya. It teaches the ultimate method, the ultimate means. And what is the ultimate means? Total and absolute dependence on, the, on, on Lord Krishna himself, on the Supreme Lord, Sriman Narayana, after giving up all these other means which do not satisfy that idea of being totally dependent, of knowing the true nature of the soul. So hereafter, he'll present the meaning of the sloka as a whole. So we've dealt with this, we've dealt with this, this point here about why, why it's called the Charma Sloka. Now, after understanding why it's called the Charma Sloka or the final, the final order or the, the ultimate order, right? The ultimate, the order of the ultimate means, right? Now we're going to, in the next sutra, we're going to understand the meaning, the general meaning. This is normally what happens is that, is that as we go along, we get the general meaning and then we're going to go into specific terms in the mantra. So now, after starting the first, uh, the first sutra, 185th sutra of the Charma Sloka Prakarnam, uh, in Mamukshapati. Now we're going to look at P.B. and Angacharya's commentary on this. And so that will come in the beginning of his section. Now the, the, the numbering systems used on the website of, with P.B. and Angacharya's commentary and in the book are slightly different. So we're not going to refer to the numbers, but we're just going to go to P.B. and Angacharya's commentary and see what he says about in the beginning of the Charma Sloka Prakarnam. So here's an introduction. This is, of course, uh, P.B. and Angacharya of Country Forums, um, Mamukshapati Sarata Dipika, which is a, a, a small commentary on Mamukshapati, which he wrote, and it's been translated into English and it's available on the internet. So, uh, Charma Sloka Prakaranam Introduction. So, previously, the Dwaya Mantra was explained. Correct. So, in the first part of that mantra, the means is explained. The means to liberation is explained. Since this means is dictated by the Lord, it is dear to him. Right. So the Lord's instructions, obviously, the Lord um, speaks very um, important instructions and they're, they're dear to him. So as seen in the sloka or the verse, that represents the entire Bhagavad Gita, right? It's the essence of the Bhagavad Gita. The Charma Sloka. Um, <coughs> chapter 18, verse 66. Therefore, this sloka was determined by our acharyas to be the third rahasya or the third secret, which is taught in the, uh, in the Sharanagati or Panchasamskara ceremony. Not only is surrender dictated by the Lord himself in this sloka, uh, it also um, shows that the sacrifice of other means as part of surrender, the sacrifice of other means as part of surrender. So paritya means we have to sacrifice other means. We have to give up other means as a part of our surrender. Sacrificing the thought that the surrender itself is the means. Okay, so, and, and, uh, and gaining release from the sins as part of the goal. Therefore, the Charma Sloka is an explanation of the Dwaya Mantra. Right. So in the Charma Sloka, he's saying here, first of all, we have to know from the Dwaya Mantra that we have to give up these other means. We have to give up karma yoga, jnana yoga, and bhakti yoga. Doesn't mean we have to give up karma, jnana, and bhakti. We can do work. We can do, we can study. We can do knowledge. We can do devotion. We can do devotional things. But we're not doing them as a sadhana. We're not doing them as a practice or a yoga to, to, to lead to yoga, to lead to um, our communion with God, our, our ultimate um, a relationship with God in, 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 in heaven, in, in Sri Vaikuntha. We're not, it's not leading to that. 
It's not a means to that end. These things. Right. So we first of all have to give up those. Give up those things. Kama yoga, yana yoga, bhakti yoga. Give those up. Give up all paths of self-effort. Right. Then we have to also surrender the idea or the thought that our surrender itself is a means. Right. So first of all, we get we have to explain to people. Right. Kama yoga, yana yoga, bhakti yoga. These ways are not going to. You're not going to be able to make it by these ways because they involve a lot of effort. They involve qualification. They involve controlling the mind. And they have to be done for a long time and they have to be done perfectly, meaning more than one lifetime sometimes. So for all these reasons, we should tell people it's very difficult to follow these other courses. Now, if they still want to follow those courses, let them follow those courses. Those courses are recommended in the scriptures by the Lord. So they are certainly dharmic things, right? They are dharmas. They are sadhanas. Yes, follow them if you want to follow them. Okay, like that. When you come to the realization that you are completely owned and controlled and supported by the Lord, that that is your true essential nature and 100% you're dependent upon the Lord. When you come to that realization, then you realize that you're not even 1%, um, <clears throat> not even 1% dependent on anybody else or yourself or your own self-effort. Then you have to give up self-effort as a means. You don't have to give up self-effort. You don't have to give up doing things. But you have to give it up as a means to liberation. In fact, Krishna says in the Gita, everybody does things. Even he does things. Everybody's effort is never given up, right? Action is never given up. But we have to give it up as a means to liberation, right? So here also, there's also that slight effort that we might say, oh, now we have to, instead of doing karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, and putting in great efforts to that, we have to at least do, make the effort to do property. No, no, that also is an effort, however small it is. Now, actually, the Tengalai Sri Vaishnava say it's not an effort. It's just a realization. All it is is a realization. All, we're not actually surrendering to the Lord. We're just realizing that we are his property. We're already surrendered to him. We're already his slaves. We're already his servants, right? So it's not a matter of saying, oh, now I surrender to you, Lord. No, no, you were always surrendered to me, right? You were always my property. You were always subservient to me, right? Now just, just understand it. Just, just, um, just realize it. Okay, so the realization that we are completely dependent on the Lord, like his property, right? That in itself is property, Right. So similarly, we should not think that property is a separate pie, just like all the others. It's not all property. You know, when people hear about property, they think, oh, surrender. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's just another thing like everything else. It's a, it's a part of bhakti, right? It's, a, it's one of those things that bhakti is a, a path of effort. And Shravanam Kirtan and Vishnusmaram, these are all different ways of parts of paths of effort within bhakti, different forms of bhakti, right? And not many Vedanam are surrendering our souls that, that we do, that's an effort that we make, that we make that effort. We have to do that. You have to do that. No, you do not. That is not property. So Atmani Vedanam, okay, maybe that may be there in Bhakti Yoga, that may be a, an effort. But property is not that. Property is not that. Real property means simply understanding or knowing who we are, what is our, assent our essential nature, that we're not even 1%, dependent on our own self-effort or any, any other effort, anybody else's effort, right? That we're completely subservient to the Lord and his property. So therefore, we also have to give up this idea that surrender itself is a means, right? Now, in the beginning, people think that surrender is a means. And in, and in fact, it's described in Sri Vajra Bhushana that in the beginning, Controlling the, controlling the mind and controlling the senses leads to a, a, a finding an acharya, finding a teacher to teach you. The teacher then gives panchasamskara, gives initiation to the disciple, gives the astakshara mantra to them. Yes, the, the, so all of these things can be considered means, right? We can consider controlling the mind, mind means. We can cons consider controlling the, the senses means. And then we attain the, uh, uh, the feet of a, an acharya. We meet an acharya, we surrender to an acharya to surrender to God through an acharya, and the acharya is therefore the means. And then, his, and then the acharya gives us the tira mantra, and he also gives us these other mantras, and these are means. These are also means, but these are all preliminary means. These are not the true means, the real means, the ultimate means, the, the primary means. The primary means is God himself. 
Sri Manarayana himself is the primary means. So there's a stage where people think that property is the means. Right? Strictly speaking, property is not the means. The Lord is the means. Right? But property appears to be the means because property is a preliminary aspect of the means. Right? So we have to, sacrificing the thought that surrender itself is a means, that has to be given up also at a certain point. Right? And gaining release from the sins as part of the goal. Gaining release from sins is part of the goal. We think, oh, we have to gain release from sins. From, from What does it mean, sins? It means the reaction to sins. Why do we have to gain release from, 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 from sins? We don't have to work hard to gain release from sins. That will come about automatically with property. Sarva Dhamma Pritya Once that is done, once we've given up all forms of self-effort, even including thinking that property is an effort, right? Because it's not an effort, really, right? Uh, and, and once we do that, then sarva pape, sarva pape bio mokshishami, the Lord will relieve us of all these sinful reactions. We don't have to worry about that. That's not our business to worry about relieving ourselves of sinful reactions, right? So these are not things that we have to worry about. Therefore, the Charma Sloka is an explanation of the Dwaya Mantra, right? Because Okay, because the Dwaya Mantra sets all this out in, in the first part of the Dwaya Mantra. The first sentence of the Dwaya Mantra is about the Upaya, is about the means. The second part is about the Upaya or the goal. So the means is very simply set out in the Dwaya Mantra. Simply surrender unto the lotus feet, the, the lotus feet of Sri Manarayana. Take shelter of the lotus feet of Sri Manarayana. Okay, so that's simple, like that. An elaboration of that is what does that mean to surrender? That means to surrender, it means to actually understand our true nature as being totally controlled, um, controlled, supported, and, and, uh, and, and owned by the Supreme Lord, right? So in that sense, get, it means give up self-effort. So that means give up, give up, the, or Sabhidharma Pritya, give up all the different forms of self-effort, including... The idea that property is a self-effort, <clears throat> right? Give up also the idea that we need to be released from all sins or all reactions from the sins. Why? Because that naturally comes along with property. So, <clears throat> so that, that, is, that, is, that is what property will be. That, and, and therefore, we're accepting simply only the realization that we are of our true nature, our Swarupa, is to be the property of the Lord. And therefore... That itself, in itself, that realization is property. And thus, by, by that realization, the Lord then becomes the means. He is the means. He is the means. Right. So, so although the first sentence of the Dwaya Mantra seems like something that we're doing, right? Sarvidama, uh, uh, um, uh, what is it? Sriman Narayana Charanam Sharanam Prapadji. Sharanam Prapadji seems like we're doing something. We're surrendering to the feet of the Lord. No, we're simply realizing that we are the property of the Lord. And that's what's being explained here. Now, but, but what is the manifestation of that? The manifestation of actually knowing that is giving up Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, and Bhakti Yoga, or even the thought that property is a yoga or a, or, or a method, right? That we have to do it, right? When we give up those things, then we actually realize what property is. That it, it is nothing but the Lord. Right? The Lord Himself is the means. Okay, so uh, so so here we can see, we can begin to see how the meaning of the Charma Sloka is explaining the first part of the Dwaya Mantra. Right. So it is the listening to the meanings of this sloka that Ramanuja walked 18 times to Tirukoti Yanambi. Right? Seeing the greatness of the sloka's meanings and the lack of people who deserve to learn them, Nambi decided to test the strength, character, and desire of Ramanuja and make him walk this many times from Sri Rangam to Tirukotia. In those days, there were no conveyances. So Ramanuja walked there and walked back, walked there and walked back 17 times. On the, on the 18th time, was he given this information, this knowledge? Satisfied with the testing, he then made Ramanuja fast for a month, 
right? And you could say, how do you fast for a month? Okay, there's different methods of fasting. So they have this Chandrayana fasting where you take one handful less or one mouthful less, less of food every day and then build up again to 15 mouthfuls over the period of a month. That's called Chandrayana fasting. There's different methods of fasting for a month. But anyway, so we don't, I don't know exactly how he, he, did the, he asked him to do the fasting, but this is one way, Chandrayana fasting. Take a vow of secrecy, right? So he said, okay, so you walked here 18 times, so I'm, I'll give you the information, but you have to fast for, first for a month, and then you have to take a vow of secrecy and not tell this to anybody else, and then taught in the meanings of the sloka. Right, so we're getting off very, very easy today, right? Because all we have to do is pick up a book or click on a website or something like that, and we are getting all this information. But in, in, in days gone by, in bygone days, let's say, right, this was very, very difficult to, to, find, to find out this information. Okay, so let's go back to the source, source book here. So now we're going to get the meaning of the sloka as a whole. Um, in text 186, by its first part, Krishna reveals what is to be done by the adhikari. The adhikari. Adhikari means a person who's qualified. So but in the last part, he reveals what is to be done by the upaya. The upaya, upaya again means means, right? The means is, of course, the, the Supreme Lord Srimanarayana, in this case, Lord Krishna, right? Krishna is Srimanarayana. Uh, so what is to be done by, by Krishna? You do your part and, and uh, Krishna does his part. Okay, so, so this is the two sections of the, of the Charma Sloka. So, so let's see, it's probably going to be divided up into uh, two lines of 16 syllables. So we're going to have the first, the first line will be Sarva Dharman Parichaja Maam Ekam Mami Kam, Charanam Vija. Then we have the second line, Ham Tvar Sarva Papi Abhyo Mokshi Yishini Masuchaha. Okay. So by the first part, Krishna reveals what is to be done by the Adhikari. And by and the last part, he reveals what is to be done by the Upaya. What it means, meaning himself. This sloka is in two sections. By the first, Krishna reveals the part which is done by the one who is qualified for the Upaya, right? Everyone's actually uh, qualified for the Upaya, but let's, 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 uh, let's get into that in a minute. But uh, by the second, he reveals the part which is to be done by himself, the Upaya, for the Adhikari. To the question, what is to be done by the Adhikari, he states, okay, so now let's see what Pibhya Dhammacharya says. So, <clears throat> oh, we should have gone through this before also. Why is it called Chalama Sloka? So just getting back uh, to a minute, uh, here it's considered to be uh, Sutra 188, which was 185 in the, in the other book. So why is it called the Chalama Sloka or the final, um, the final verse or the final instruction? Because it shows the final means of, to reaching him. In the prior sections of the Bhagavad Gita, Sri Krishna has explained other means of, to liberation, such as karma yoga and jnana yoga, and also bhakti yoga. Upon hearing them, Arjuna thought that these were not easy to follow. He also felt that for, this, for a soul, such efforts were not in tune with its nature of being completely dependent on him, on the Supreme Lord, and therefore were truly obstacles to the nature of to the realization of that nature. Thinking that it is impossible to reach him through such means, and therefore reaching him is a lost cause, Arjuna became grief stricken. In order to remove this sorrow of Arjuna, Krishna taught him this final means, which is easy to follow and is in tune with the soul's true nature. Since this sloka explains that final means, it became to be known as the Charma Sloka. Okay, very good. And continuing on, 
Uh, text 189 here. Uh, this sloka is made up of two parts. The first talks about what, ha- what should be done by, by one who has the right to this means, or the Adhikari. The second talks about what is done by him, the Supreme Lord, for this person, for the person who uh, um, follows this instruction. So let's go back to the main text. Okay, so this is a question. What is to be done by the Adhikari? What do we have to do? What is the Charma Sloka? Bhagavad Gita 1866. What is it telling us to do? Right. So, uh, text 187 here. What the Adhikari has to do is to accept the Upaya. We have to accept the Upaya. What's, who is the Upaya? The Upaya is Sri Manarayana. We have to accept him. What the Adhikari must do, do is to accept the Supaya. Uh, uh, and he says here, quote, but, but why? Rather than enjoining them, does he say, relinquish other Upayas? To this he replies, okay, so we have to accept the Lord, but we also have to reject some other things, right? We have to reject self-effort, basically. So, but why, rather than enjoining them, does he say to, to relinquish other dharmas? In other words, it, if Krishna, why doesn't Krishna just say, surrender to me in the first part? Uh, why, doesn't he, why doesn't he say that right, right away? Why does he start off by saying, give up, give up, sarva dharma pritaja, abandon all, completely abandon all, all, all forms of self-effort? Why does he say that first? Mami comes Sharanambraja, he says, and, and surrender unto, only unto me. So he does say that, surrender unto me. But why does he say this first? So he enjoins this along with its anga. Its anga means its part or its um, ancillary part. He enjoins acceptance of this upaya, meaning the, the Supreme Lord, along with its accessory or ancillary anga. That is relinquishing other upayas. The Shastras say, okay, so, 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 okay, so in Sanskrit, there's, there are different, mm, there are different rules and regulations given in the scriptures. So there's a specific form that rules and regulations are, are usually given in, right? So this is, uh, that the, this is going to show that the Charma Sloka is given in that same form that other scriptural um, orders are given, right? So what he says here, so, for, so first of all, basically, first of all, relinquishing other, other means, then surrender unto me, right? That's the, that's the order that it's given. So having washed his feet, he should sip water, right? So this is a, this is a, uh, this is a, um, a statement. Anybody that reads any prayoga or any procedure of doing any particular ritual, it will start off with this. It will say, first of all, after you've washed your feet, then do archimana, right? Archimana is the sipping of water at the beginning of a ritual, and it includes the washing of the feet, which is done first. So wash the feet and then sip water, right? So having washed his feet, he should sip water, archimana, right? That's an example of a way that, an order is given or a, or a rule is given. So having bathed, he should worship as required. Right? That's another example. So yes, we should do. So instead of saying, go do the worship, and then saying, wait, 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 wait. Take a bath first before you go to the worship. Right? Or instead of saying, sip water, do archmana. Wait, 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 stop. First of all, you have to wash your feet, then do archmana. Right? So instead of doing it like that, instead of, instead of telling the thing that has to be done first, we first have to say the thing which has, is a preliminary to that. The preliminary to that is having washed the feet, then sip water, having bathed, then worship, right? having stood up, then offer handfuls of water to the sun. We offer in Sanya Vandana, we offer Argya to the sun, right? Bhana, right? So offer argya to the sun, having stood up, up on the tippy toes and offer the argya. That's how we do it in the Sanjivandana. Having meditated on him, he should repeat the mantra. 
right? This is very important for anybody who's repeating mantras, right? Having meditated upon him, repeat the mantra. Don't just start repeating any mantra. Just start chanting a mantra, right? Oh, yes, yes let's chant the mantra. Having meditated upon, that's why in the procedure for, for chanting a mantra, first of all, there's nyasa, first of all, there's dhyana. Dhyana is important. Meditation. Meditate on the deity of the mantra, then chant the mantra. Having meditated upon him, on the on the person, the devata of the mantra, the, the deity of the mantra, he should repeat the mantra. Not that he should just repeat the mantra. Right? And so this Sanskrit quote is unknown, but it's a really good quote. Okay, so we should probably write this down. I'll look up look up the Sanskrit for this and we'll write it down and we'll quote it to people. Right? Having washed the feet, perform achman. Having bathed, perform worship. Right? Having stood up, offer, offer, argue to the sun. And having meditated upon the deity of the mantra, then chant the mantra. So this is the this is the order. So this is this example is being given to, to teach people the proper method of, of giving a scriptural injunction, a scriptural order. So how is the Chama Soka like that? Having relinquished, having completely abandoned all religion, all, 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 all varieties of religion or paths of self-effort, having done that, then surrender unto me. And me alone, mom, a come only me. Right? That's the way it's given in the Chanama Sloka, also. Like that. We can also note um, that the, even, even the Brahma Sutra starts off like this. It says, Now is the time to think about spiritual things. Atato Brahma Jigyasa. Now is the time to inquire into the, the knowledge of Brahman or the knowledge of spiritual things. Now means. After having understood the Karmakanda section, right? Now understand the Brahmakanda section. After having, after having understood the, the section on karma in the, in the Vedas, now go to the section on jnana, on, on, on knowledge of Brahman, on knowledge of, of spirit. So that word atta is that first part of the order, right? We don't say, we don't say, Start, start thinking about start thinking about spiritual things. We say now start thinking of spiritual things. Now meaning what? Now after some other things were done, prerequisites, now do this. Right. So continuing on, this means that for Achamana and other such rites, one cannot perform them without the foot washing, etc., which are said to be their angas or, acc or accessories. In that, in, in the same way, the gerund, right? Gerund means a verbal noun, right? Um, in English, to make a gerund, we usually put ing on the end of a noun, uh, uh, so on the end of a verb, and it makes it so that, for instance, the verb to walk, right, becomes the noun walking, right? Uh, the or swim, swimming. Fly, flying, like this. So gerund, <coughs> uh, verbal noun, right? Ending, ending of a verb, uh, right? Uh, translated as having. So here in Sanskrit, they put a put an ending. They put an ending on a word, and they say. So for instance, foot wash, uh, foot washing. So they'll put an ending on foot washing, having washed. It means having washed. Right, having washed. When washing is finished, having washed, right, is a gerund. Having washed the feet, then do achaman. So, in the same way, the gerund ending of the verb translated as having such and such, having done such and such, confirms that acceptance can't be done without relinquishing the other requires. Acceptance of the Lord as the only means as the means of our liberation cannot be done without relinquishing or completely abandoning prityajya 
the other upayas, sarva dharman. Without giving up these other upayas, without giving up these other means, you can't accept the Lord as a means. So some people say, well, we can have it all. We can do karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, and prapti, and we can accept the Lord also. So we can do all those things, and we can also accept the Lord. No, that's not what's said here. It is, it is, it, it is it understood, at least by the, the, the Southern School of Sri Vaishnavas, it's understood to be uh, in the form of having done this or having abandoned these things, then you can take the Lord as your means, as your only means, right? By surrendering unto him. <clears throat> Confirms the acceptance can't be done without relinquishing the other, the other so-called upayas, the other means, the other so-called means of karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, or even thinking the property is a means in itself, right? Therefore, the anuvad argument is wrong. Anuvad. So there's two. Um, there's two understandings of the way that the charma sloka can be understood as right, and then and. The Northern School of Sri Vaishnavas, the Vatagalais, they tend to think that, anuv- that, that it is an Anuvad. It, uh, and, uh, and the Southern School they tend to accept it as a Vidhi. A vidhi means it's, a, it's an order. But this has to be done. This has to be given up before this can be accepted. Right? Whereas Anuvad means it can be, it, they can, they're going to all be accepted at the same time. So therefore, what the Southern Acharyas are saying is that the, the argument given by the Vodagalais or the Northern Acharyas is wrong, but this is not an Anubhad, this is just not an explanation that, that all these things can be done so, uh, at the same time, right? It can be accepted at the same time. This argument maintains that when Krishna says, Sarvadharma Pritya having relinquished all dharmas, he refers to a situation which has already occurred due to Arjuna's consideration of the difficulty of, the, of these dharmas. It is only then that Krishna enjoins the Siddhopaya, the ultimate, the Siddha, the, perf- the perfect means, the perfect means. Krishna is the perfect means. Right, so let's hear that again. This argument that when Krishna says, Sarvadama Pritija, having relinquished all dharmas, he refers to a situation which has already occurred due to Arjuna's consideration of the difficulty of, the, of these dharmas, it is only then that Krishna enjoins the Siddhapaya. So has Arjuna given up all, all his ideas of self-effort or has he not? So the idea of Anuvada is that he's already, given, he's already considered them and rejected them. But the... The, the, the Vidhi system or the Vidhi understanding is that, no, you have to actually give up these, right, these ideas. Then you can accept the Lord as the, the Upaya. But this Upaya, so let's look at the, at the footnote here. Okay. Okay, so this is going to explain it. Manavala Mahamuni here is clearly attacking Vedanta Deshika so Manavala Mahamuni and Pila Lokacharya of the Southern School of Sri Vaishnavism, Vedanta Deshika and some other Acharyas of the Northern School of Sri Vaishnavism, the Tengalized versus the Watergalized. So Manavala Mahamuni is clearly attacking Vedanta Deshika's view that the gerund form of the verb, Parityajya, is a gerund form, verbal noun, meaning relinquishing, relinquishing or having relinquished Right. Remember, I said if we put ing on the end, that's what it is in, in English. In English, it can be either relinquishing or having relinquished. Right, relinquishing or having relinquished means that relinquishing all dharmas is not a part of the vidhi or the the, in, the injunction, but an anuvada or a statement of the situation that has already occurred. So either it's a part of the vidhi, the injunction, Saradama Pritija is either part of the injunction, is part of the rule, in which case we call it the vidhi, or it is an anuvada, it is just simply a statement of what's already occurred. 
right? It's already occurred that Arjuna has already rejected all of these things that Lord Krishna said by the time he gets to the, to the end of the 18th chapter, right? Then it would be called an Anuvada. Deshika, in his Rahasya Triasaram, which is Deshika's magnum opus of his esoteric works, his works on the, on the Rahasyas, right? Rahasya Triasaram, the essence, the Saram, of the Rahasya Triya, of the Three Secrets. This is a book which we should also study, right? Just to understand the similarities and the slight differences between the two um, schools of Sri Vaishnavism. So, Vedanta Deshika, uh, in uh, Rahasya Triya Saram, Chapter 29, argues that the other sadhanas, such as Bhakti Yoga, are valid upayas. They are valid means. So karma yoga, jnana yoga, bhakti yoga, all of these are taught by the Lord as means to liberation. So they're valid means. This is Deshika's point. They must be valid means. They're taught by the Lord in the scripture. Right? And that Krishna is not ordering Arjuna to give them up. That's what Vedanta Deshika says. Rather, recognizing that Arjuna is too impatient for moksha to undertake the lengthy and difficult course of bhakti yoga, what to speak of karma yoga and jnana yoga, right? Krishna enjoins property, which is an easier and quicker upaya, suitable for those who lack any of the necessary qualifications, including patience and stamina, for bhakti yoga, what to speak of, karma yoga and jnana yoga. And we can see, we can see, uh, if, we, if we go a little bit further on, this will be further explained in, uh, in, in Sutra 202, which we'll come to shortly. And there'll be another note on this as well. So you can, can you see the difference? Can you see the difference in the, in the, in the different interpretation of the Southern School and the Northern School? of the Charma Sloka. The, the Wadagalais say, yes, you can do Bhakti Yoga. You can do Bhakti Yoga also, do Karma Yoga also, do Gani Yoga also. You can, do all these, you, can, you can do all these other means. You can, you can perform self-efforts. In fact, you must perform self-efforts. Remember the two, the, ana the analogy of the, the cat and the monkey. The baby monkey must grab hold of the mother monkey's back. There must be self-effort. Without that self-effort, without that self-effort, right, the baby monkey will fall down. Even though the mother is taking the greatest effort, going from tree to tree or going from place to place and carrying the weight of the baby, still the baby has to make some effort to grasp hold of the mother's back. Otherwise, the baby will fall down. So what is necessary for the baby safe, uh, safe, safely being carried from one place to another by the mother monkey? There's a necessity for the mother monkey to have the strength and have the ability to carry the baby. And that, that is surely the greatest strength, right? Much greater than the ability of the baby because if the baby could move from tree to tree by itself, it wouldn't need to have, grab hold of the mother. So there is still that small amount of strength needed by the baby to hang on to the mother. In the other example, by the, that's the example of the northern acharyas. It is called cooperative grace. God will only give you his grace if you cooperate. There must be faith in God, but there also has to be works. The individual has to engage in works uh, in, in, in works such as karma yoga, jnana yoga, and bhakti yoga, self-efforts has to engage in self-efforts in order for the God to shower his grace upon that individual. That is called cooperative grace. That is called sahetika kripa. Sahetika kripa means grace of God that has a cause. The cause is the work done or the, or the different efforts or self-efforts done by the individual. We do some, we chant Jabba, we chant, we do puja, we do yajna, 
We do bhakti yoga. We do karma yoga. We do jnana yoga. We put out those efforts there. Yes, the, then the, the Lord showers us with his grace and his efforts to save us are hundreds and thousands and millions of times greater than our efforts, but our efforts still have to be there to get his grace. That is the understanding of the Northern School. That is the understanding of Vedanta Deshika. That is the understanding of most Vaishnavas. That is, in fact, the understanding of most religionists, right? Whether they be Vaishnavas or Christians or Muslims or whatever, that you must do something to get the grace of God. Whereas the Tengalai Acharyas, the southern school of Sri Vaishnavas, right, believe in near Hetuka Kripa, not Sa Hetuka Kripa, Sa means with. with. Hetuka means cause, with cause. Uh, Compassion or grace of God with cause. What is the cause? The cause is our efforts. The tangle, I say, no, the cause is not our efforts. The cause of God's grace. God's grace is irresistible. God's grace is, is, is causeless. Right? There are also some Christians who also believe this, who accept this. There are some religionists who also believe this outside of Vaishnavism and Hinduism. Right? It means that the Lord's grace is causeless. There is no cause for it, right? That we do not, like the cat, like the mother cat, the mother cat comes along and simply picks up the baby. The baby kitten is completely helpless. He doesn't put in any effort. That baby kitten makes no effort, absolutely no effort. The mother will save the, the baby kitten without accept, without requiring there to be any prerequisite effort by the, by the kitten. It is solely the strength of the mother cat that saves the kitten. The kitten doesn't do anything, doesn't require any strength at all to be saved. He's simply saved by the, by the causeless grace of the mother. So similarly, like this, we cannot do anything to save ourselves ultimately. There is nothing that we can do to save ourselves. The only thing that we can do to save ourselves is if we come to the realization that we cannot save ourselves by doing anything. Right? That is not actually doing something. That's simply a realization. The realization that we can't do anything to save ourselves is what saves us. Again, we can talk about the drowning man. If the drowning man thinks that he can save himself or he can even help the lifeguard to save him, right? He ends up impeding the lifeguard. A per there's nothing more frustrating than trying to save somebody who's fighting you when you're trying to save them. You want, you've got to constantly tell the person, give up, stop. Stop struggling. Stop being hysterical. Calm, just... Relax. Just go limp in my arms and I will save you. This is, this is what lifeguards say all the time to people who are drowning. I'm here. Calm down. Don't be hysterical. Stop flailing around because you're hitting me. You're, you're stopping me from saving you. Your, your efforts to try to save yourself, however meager they are, are stopping me from saving you. In the same way, the Lord says to us, you doing these efforts is stopping you from coming to me because you, are, you will not be able to do them successfully. You are only doing them because you have ahankara. You have mamakara. You have these false notions of I and mine. You have this false notion that you can in some way help yourself. Give that up. That is what Krishna is saying. In the beginning of Charma Sarva, he's saying, Sarva Dhamma Paritya abandon all varieties of self effort. Stop thinking that you can save yourself. You are drowning. Stop being hysterical. Stop trying flailing around. Stop trying to, to save yourself. Stop it. And I will save you. Surrender unto me. I'll save you. Just give up and, and leave it up to me. Leave it all up to me. Leave everything up to me. That's what Krishna is saying. So that is the idea of the Southern School, right? So there's a big difference there. There is a big difference.
between Sahitika Kripa and Nirhitika Kripa, be, between caused grace, caused by our efforts. God's grace is caused only by our efforts, our, only by our co cooperative grace. We, we cooperate with God or we don't cooperate with God. The baby monkey cooperates with the mother and is saved. The, 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 kitten, the kitten doesn't have to offer any cooperation whatsoever. Even the kitten fights against the mother. Even the baby kitten fights against the mother and doesn't want to be saved. The mother will save the kitten anyway. The mother has the strength to overcome. God has the strength to overcome all our resistance. It's like a super lifeguard. So he's saying to us, just relax, but he is able to, he's able to catch us and to, to grab us and to, and to save us, even though we don't want to be saved. Even though we, you know, we may make an, an, initial, an initial prayer to, to be saved or something like that, or we may try to be saved, but we're, we're constantly regressing and going and doing something which is against the, uh, our nature. What's our true nature? Our true nature is to be like a, to be like a possession, to be like an insentient possession uh, of the Lord, to be his property, to just be like his property. The property doesn't you know, if if I own something, if I have, if I if I own a book, the book doesn't, the book doesn't. If I pick up the book, if I drop the book, if I open the book, close the book, the book doesn't object to whatever I do to this book. The book doesn't object. It's my book. It's my possession. If we become like that, then the Lord will save us, just like the mother cat. Even if we rebel against the Lord. Some people, you know, the, the, the Northern School, they're all worried about, oh, after we surrender to the Lord, maybe we do something wrong or maybe we, we, we forget about that or maybe we tr go and do something else. Lord Rama says, Sakrideva Prapannaya, just once, Tavasmiti Chiyachite, just, much, just, just once think, I am yours. I am your possession. Just once think that. Sakrideva. Eva means only. Sacred means once. Only once think that. The Lord takes that surrender, that one surrender, as an excuse to save the so the kitten, even if he even if the kitten fights against the mother, the mother will save it. The mother will save it no matter whether we struggle or we don't struggle, the Lord is going to save us like that. Whether we try to cooperate with the Lord or we don't try to cooperate at all, he'll save us. That's the point. That's the point being made by Lord Krishna in the, in the Charma Sloka, right? And that's what the thing, the Tengal Acharyas, what the, the Southern Vaishnava Acharyas are saying. Now, in different religions and also in Sri Vaishnavism, there are these two types of people who believe in Sakri Kritika and Nihiritika Kripa. Okay, like that. But it's very, very clear where where Pila Lokacharya and Manavala Mahamuni fall down. Now. Should we, should we not know the arguments of Vedanta Deshika and the Northern School? We should know them. We should know their arguments like that. And we should consider them. And if we're, if we're, uh, if we're convinced of those arguments, we can adopt that, we can adopt that form. If, we, if we're convinced of the, uh, of the, of the Southern School Acharya's <clears throat> arguments, then we can adopt that form. But here in Mamukshapati, this is what he's teaching. This is what Pila Lokacharya and Manavala Mahamuni are teaching is the, is the true understanding of the Charma Sloka. Right? This argument maintains that when Krishna says Sarvadam Pritija, having relinquished all dharmas, he refers to a situation which is already done, it's already occurred due to Arjuna's consideration of the difficulties of these dharmas. It is only then that Krishna enjoins the Siddhopaya or the perfect, the perfect means, which is surrender unto himself. Like that. That is the Wadagalai argument. That is the argument of the Wadagalais, right? That uh, the, this is that is an anuvad. That that all these things, this Sarvadama Pritija, Krishna doesn't really mean to give these things up. He doesn't really mean you have to give these things up. Right? That is a, that is a situation which has already occurred. You know, we don't have to worry about that. You know, the, right? Whereas the the Tengalai charts are saying no. We actually have to give these things up. What are we giving up? We're giving up the mentality that we can save ourselves. We're giving up the mentality that even a small amount of our self-effort is what is needed. It's not needed. 
All that is needed is to surrender. Surrender is not an act. Surrender is a realization. Because the other side, the northern, northern Acharyas will say, no, surrender is an act. You're doing it. It's an effort. Surrender is an effort. However slight effort, however small it is, it's still an effort. No, it's not. It is not an effort. It is simply a realization of fact. The fact is we are, our Swarupa, our, our, our actual being is that of a, of, a, of a piece of property of the Lord. We are surrendered already to the Lord. Already. Already we're a piece of this property. We always have been. We never can be anything else. That is our nature. We just have to realize that. That is our nature. The realization of that is that is property. That's what property is. That's the realization. As soon as we realize that, the Lord becomes everything. The Lord becomes the means. Okay. So continuing on. But this upaya is desired or preferred, raga prapta, right? Prapta means to, um, to obtain. Raga means uh, Raga, in the sense, I'm not sure exactly Raga Prapta, what it would mean. Let's have a look at the dictionary for a quick minute. Raga Prapta. Raga, mm, active, mm, means color, feeling of passion. So the desire for to attain, the, the desire for attainment, the desire for attainment, the desire to preferred uh, Raga Prapta. But this upaya, the upaya meaning uh, surrender to the Lord, right? Because of its easiness, etc. So does it need to be enjoined? So this question here applies. Okay, so now Manavala Mamani is, is posing this question, right? So if this is natural, if the whole thing is natural, if, if we just realize the nature of the soul, the swarupa of the soul as being the property of the Lord, then why does he have to tell us to do it? Why does he say, abandon all these paths of self-effort? Why does he say that if it's just natural, right? Or if, the, if, it's, if it's like what the what did I say, if it's already occurred, why does he mention it then, right? In the same way as if somebody's already washed their feet, then why tell them to wash their feet, right? If, so, if I saw somebody had already washed their feet, then I would, wouldn't say, First, wash your feet, then say Achman. I would just say, say Achman, because I've seen you washed your feet. So, if that's already occurred, as the water guys say, right, then why would, why would he mention it again? Why would he say that? That's a good question. Okay, so before we go to that question, let's see what Hibi Anangacharya says for this next, uh, for this last, last sutra. So, remember in the last sutra, it says, um, uh, what should one who is qualified for it do? He should accept this means completely. This is what is explained in the first part, right? So that was what we, that was what we just discussed, that what should the person do? He should accept this means completely. This is what except in the first part of the Charma Sloka, it's explained that the person who is the Adhikari, the person who is qualified for this upaya or property, property is... Remember, everybody's qualified for property, okay? So because everybody's, everybody's qualified for property, why? Because everybody is a piece of property of the Lord. Everybody belongs to the Lord. Everything belongs to the Lord. Everything belongs to the Lord. Everything is created by the Lord. Everything is maintained by the Lord. Everything is uh, controlled by the Lord. Everything is supported by the Lord. The Lord is everything, is the, is the master of everything and everyone, okay? So everyone is therefore qualified because everybody is a is a, is a piece of property of the Lord's property. So therefore, buddy, everybody is qualified. So, so we shouldn't get confused when he keeps talking about the Adhikari for property. The Adhikari, everybody's qualified. And if we continue on. Um, instead of just saying that he should accept this means fully, why is sacrificing all other means, Sarvadama Pritija, being told? If accepting the, the means is the body, right, then its parts must also be explained. Giving up all other means is the part. We discussed that. Giving up 
All it means is an ancillary. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a part of the surrender, right? It's the first part. Just like washing the feet is a part of Achmana. It's the first part. It's the preliminary. For example, in following certain rituals such as Achmana, it has certain parts such as washing the feet and hands and feet, etc. The Achmana cannot be performed without doing these first. Similarly, complete surrender cannot be done without following the part, the first, that part of it, which is sacrifice of all other means. Right. I'm not exactly sure how many we, we did here before we go back. Since this surrender is easy to follow, would it not come easily? Why does it, why does it have to be commanded to be followed? And this is the question which is being asked now in the main text. It is easy. It is true that it is easy. But by being commanded to follow, it means that it will now be accepted immediately. Okay? So getting back to the main text. Text 189. If the desired or preferred Raghapapti Upaya, Upaya, Right? The preferred upaya is now called raga prapta. So don't get confused. Raga prapta just means the preferred upaya, right? The preferred means. Right. If the preferred means is made obligatory, this will make it readily accessible. Milk is desirable because of its pleasurable nature. If it is, uh, if it is ordered to be taken as a med medicine for bil biliousness, right? If some sometimes uh, people take milk because they have too much bile, right? Okay, so um, I think, I'm not sure exactly, but uh, maybe this also has to do with um, the difference between taking milk and then, and then taking milk as in the form of yogurt to, uh, to fix the diseases that come from taking too much milk or whatever. Just milk in another form. Anyway. This will, this will make it even more likely to be taken quickly. Right. So it's a pleasure to take milk, right? But if we have some disease which is cured by milk and somebody says, oh, take milk and you'll live, oh, it, that's a pleasure. It's a pleasurable medicine that can be taken. So in the same way, <clears throat> it is the same uh, with this upaya, this upaya of you know, surrender to the Lord, which is more desirable than other upayas because of its excellence. So because this is easier, surer, 100% sure, right, quicker, gives fruits at the end of this life, whereas the others could drag on for lifetime after lifetime, right? That means it's excellent. It's more excellent. Property is more excellent than these other so-called upayas of Kama Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, right? Property is more, uh, is more excellent, is more, effic more efficacious, quicker and easier and safer. So if one is enjoined to accept it, this will help it to be accepted even more readily. So this is the answer to that question. So the question is, why does it have to be enjoined? No, it doesn't have to be enjoined at all. But if it is enjoined, It'll help for it to it'll help for it to occur. So Krishna doesn't have to tell us to surrender. We're already surrendered, right? But we have to come to that realization. And in order to come to that realization, Krishna mentions it. And therefore it'll be quicker for us to come to that realization by Krishna mentioning it. So after this, a number, in order to reveal its meaning by uh, word by word, he states the number of words in the first sentence. So let's go and see what P.V. Nangacharya says about up to this point. So, again, here it says, um, he's given a whole lot of sutras here from 93, 193 to 197. Um, we'll see what, that, what, what numbers they are in the, in the other text. But anyhow, the first portion of this sloka is made up of six parts. Right. Uh, in it, the first part, which is called Sarva Dharman, means all dharmas. Dharma is that which is the means towards a particular end. 
right? So it's an apaya. Since this, or means, since this uh, prakarnam, right, this section of the book is about the means for liberation, the dharma term used here is about the means for that liberation and not about the means for either, for either the temporary goals of this world or the goals of other worlds such as heaven. So if we go back to the main text, it's also going to be explained. Right? The first, the first uh, we'll, we'll go through a few different uh, mantras here, a few different uh, sutras here. Uh, 190, the first sentence of this mantra is six words. So six words. Sarva, Dharman, Parityaja, Mam, Ekam, Charnam, Vraja. Six. Sarva, Dharman, Parityaja, Mam, Ekam, Charnam, Vraja. Okay, apparently six words. So Sarva, Dharman, I think he's, he's making as one word. Right? The first sentence uh, in this mantra, six words. So Sarvadamam is one word. Paritaja. Maam ekam. Maam ekam. Charanam praja. Right. So that's six words. Right. So he presents the first word, Sarvadamam, and reveals its meaning. So, uh, text 191. Sarvadamam means all dharmas. And again, what did he say? The, the PBA and the charge of dharmas means of pious, means of attaining some goal. And here we're talking about the goal of liberation. We're not talking about any goal of going to heaven or enjoying anything in this material world. This compound has three parts. The word dharma, the plural ending, and the word sarva. So, okay, so we have the word dharma, right, which is the main word in sarva dharma, right? Dharma, we have to understand as being upaya, as the means, as, as other means, right? These are so-called upayas according to the the southern school, these are actual opias according to the northern school. All right. So they're opias. They're, they're, they're parts of self-effort towards liberation. All right. Then the word sarva. The word sarva is means all. So it's a like a uh, it's an adjective um, uh, appended to dharma to show that not just one dharma, not just this dharma or that dharma, but all dharmas, all self-efforts, all all methods of attaining something, of attaining a goal, right? All methods, right? All means, right? And these are means of self-effort, of course, all means, right? And then uh, because it's, uh, it's, it, it talks about all, then it's naturally, it, the compound is naturally in a plural case. Okay, so it's in the plural, it's in the instrumental plural, right? Triti uh, Vibhakti, Bahuvachanam. So it is, it is therefore Sarva Dharman, Right? Dharmaha, Dharmao, Dharmaha, Dharmam, Dharmao, Dharman, Dharman, Sarva Dharman, right? So it's in the plural. In order to give the meaning of all three, he first presents the definition of Dharma. Okay, so now we're getting into the meaning of the individual words. We've understood that there are six words in the first part of the Charma Sloka. So the Charma Sloka is going to be explained now. We've understood the general meaning of the Charma Sloka. We've understood why it's called the Charma Sloka. And now we're going into the word for word meaning. So this is probably a good place to stop here today, right? Because we are going to get into some minute details, although we've already got into some minute details. We're going to get into some minute details of what each particular word means or each part of the word means, right? So. Interesting, inter very interesting introduction. Do we have any questions or comments about number one, the Charma Sloka in general? Number two, the why it's called the Charma Sloka, why it's called the ultimate or final instruction. And number three, the, uh, the, the general meaning of the, of the mantra and whether it's a video or anubhada. If there are any questions. Well, again, you made it very clear about the, the, the vidya, and it makes more sense, you know, taking it as a, a vidhi than an anuvada, definitely. I like the point that also made about the parityaja also means including prapati. 
And um, because I, I know of one um, teacher that mentions that, you know, there's Prapati Yoga also. You know, there's Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Bhakti Yoga, and then Prapati Yoga. And it's nice that you also clear that people up. Say that. Even people, that idea. people say that. People say, people say, people say Prapati Yoga. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm not going to have an argument with somebody if they, if they come out with, even Rami uses Sadanga Yoga. He called it Sadanga, Prapati is Sadanga Yoga. Property is property yoga. Okay, it's yoga. It's a, it's a, it's a, yoga means a, a, a method to link with the supreme. Okay, but property itself, yeah. the idea that's very interesting that here PB and Andacharya and even in the text he's saying that if you think that property is the way, that's also a little bit wrong. The the Lord Himself is mm-hmm. the way. The Lord Himself is the way, like yeah. that. But in the beginning, we tell people, oh, property is the way, surrender is the way, like that. Then they come up with all these ideas. Oh, but surrender has to be over a lifetime. And, you know, you can't ever slip. You can't ever make a mistake. You have to be perfect. Your surrender has to be perfect. You say surrender, but you, when you say it, you say, say it like such an easy thing, you know, just say I'm yours one time. And that's what Rama says, not me. Okay. So mm-hmm. you say it's such an easy thing like that and, and, and that you don't have to do it all the time and you can, you know, maybe you go revert back and you rebel against God, but still He's going to save you. We don't accept this. Yeah, ha- your surrender has to be perfect. Yeah, you're not really surrendered. That's you're not ta- you're talking you're not talking about real surrender. Real surrender means for a lifetime, and you have to follow the rules and regulations. If you make one slip, you're you're finished, and you can't. If you don't remember God at the time of death, no, oh, no, no, that's not surrender. You have to. Real surrender means it has to be done absolutely perfectly. This, that, and the other. So there are people there. Are, I mean, that's practically everybody you talk to will say that. You, yeah. you say, yes, surrender is the way. Oh, we're already surrendered. We're surrendering to the Lord through bhakti yoga. We're surrendering to the Lord through jnana yoga or karma yoga, whatever it is. We're surrendered. No, 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 no. You're not absolutely surrendered. And does that absolute surrender have to be? No, that has to be all for the life. See, first of all, you get into the thing about what does it mean, actual surrender? They have a completely different idea of what actual surrender is, right? Mm. It sounds the same. Which we sound like we're talking the same thing, but when we get down to the, the, the definition, it's a completely different idea. So then actual surrender or true surrender is misunderstood between the different peoples, right? Even the different schools of true Vaishnavism, but even between other relig- religionists, other Vaishnavas, other Hindus, other Christians and Muslims and whatever, actual surrender is misunderstood by them, right? So the, the tangle eyes under, is a true understanding, it's the true deepest understanding because they understand that this surrender is nothing but a realization. It's not an effort in itself. Mm-hmm. It's not a self-effort. It is different. It is Because that's what the people think. Oh, you know, these guys are preaching this. Bhakti yoga and chanting this and doing that and everything like that. And you guys are doing chanting that and doing this and everything like that. And you're also, it's just another, you're just teaching it. It's just a different tradition and it's the same principle. No, it's not the same principle at all. Their principle is Sahitaka Kripa, right? The northern mm-hmm. acharyas, the other, other, their principle is, is cooperative grace. Our principle is not. Our principle is, is causeless grace, irresistible grace. Mm-hmm. irresistible we cannot resist it we must be mm-hmm. saved right even mm-hmm. if we try to resist it we can we're going to be saved yes irresistible grace the was this grace that yes. is our principle that is completely different from their principle their principle is you don't do this you don't get that their principle is what we call in latin quid pro quo this for that quid pro quo mm-hmm. means this for that I do this and you do that. And they say, well, all you have to do is this little thing. This small thing you have to do is simply chant the name one time. Ajamil chanted Narayana one time at the time of death. All he had to do was that and he was saved like that. So it's so easy. Even a child can do it. Even a dog can do it. You know, it ought, they simply and have to cry, do it like this. It involves <laughs> some effort. It involves some effort. But it's a tiny little effort. So why don't you just do it like that? And we, our point is like this. No, there is no effort. Yeah. There is simply realization. And that realization, uh, Shankaracharya says, this, uh, in, in, a, in a sense, if you read that, 
if you read that article by Patricia Mummy about uh, the, the Charma Sloka, where she talks about Shankara's yeah. ghost, she Shankara's says, book. Shankara says, Gyanat Moksha. Moksha comes from Jnana, from knowledge. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly what we're saying. But he's saying mm -hmm. different way. He's saying Moksha comes from the knowledge that we're all one. No, we don't agree with that. That's complete bogus. That's wrong. We do agree that, that true knowledge means that we understand that we're the, we're the, we're, we belong to the Lord, that we're his property and that we're his servant. That true knowledge, that true self-realization, that, that leads to Moksha. That leads to moksha, of course, because as soon as we surrender, in the sense that we just realize who we are, we realize that true nature, God takes over. He takes over. Okay. Because I think the whole root of that is to understand that you can't surrender because you, you had nothing in the first place. So that they all accept that. So they all yeah. accept that, you know, you, you belong to God. So the thing is that saying to surrender is not possible anyway because you can't. You, can. you, you, you never belong to yourself. Your body didn't belong to you. And you, even you, the jiva, the soul, doesn't belong to you. So therefore, there's nothing to surrender. Yes. And therefore, it is. What, 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 they, what they're saying is they're saying, offer your soul to God. Surrender your soul to God. Your soul doesn't belong to you to give to God. Exactly. Your, God, your soul was... You have stolen your soul from God. You have stolen yourself away from God. You belong to God and you say, you're saying now, I don't belong to God. I belong to myself. And now out of my mag magnanimity, right, my magnanimity, I'm going to offer myself back to God. What hypocrisy is that? That is total hypocrisy. If I say, if I come to you, I come to your house. And you have a book, you know, on your coffee table, and uh, and I'm your guest, and I steal that book, right? And I say, mm -hmm. "Happy birthday, happy birthday!" Here, here's here's a book. I'm I'm giving you this book. I'm offering you this. You say, "This is my book." <laughs> what hypocrisy is that? What hypocrisy yeah. is that? That I I've stolen the soul. I've stolen the soul away from God away from God's service, its natural position is to serve God and to do whatever he says, right? And I have, I have taken that away and I've done all these nonsense things in the material world, right? And I've committed so many sins and everything. I've done everything against what he wants, right? And now I, th now I come to the realization after I've read some scriptures and done some things like that, I come to the realization, oh, I shouldn't have done that. I should actually offer my soul back to God. And I come to God and I say, hey, I'm offering myself to you. And he's saying, who are you to offer yourself to me? You are mine. Already. Even saying that means you have ego. Even to say that. Ego. ego. That's ego. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the Both point. a hankara and mamakara <laughs> at the same time. It's yeah. ultimate ego. Yeah. Yeah, and this is what the Southern School Acharya say to Vedanta Deshika's point. See, because Vedanta Deshika is very interested. He's very interested in, in uh, fighting against the Advaitins and the, and the people of different sects, of Vedantic sects. So what he does is he emphasizes the things which are said in the Upanishads, which are that they emphasize the, 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 the doership of the soul. The soul is a doer, is a carter, Right. So the soul is a doer, the soul is an enjoyer, the soul, the soul is eternal, the soul is a, you know, like that. So those things he emphasizes. But the real thing that the, 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 the Tengalai Sri Vaishnava's Acharyas emphasize is the subservience, the, the nature of the soul, the true nature of the soul, right, is that he is not a doer, an independent doer. So, yeah, maybe the soul's a doer, but he's not an independent doer. He's not independent anything in any way. He's completely dependent, and therefore that's the essence of his nature is to be completely dependent. And if he is completely dependent, controlled, owned, supported by the Lord, therefore he cannot in any way, shape, or form offer himself to the Lord because the Lord already owns him and controls him and supports him in every way. So any, any, any thinking like that is wrong thinking. Is wrong thinking. So if we do something based on wrong thinking, that's wrong. Simple. We should always do something based on right thinking. Once we have the right thinking, we actually don't have to do anything. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. Once we yeah. once we get the right attitude. So what does it mean? Uh, Prabhupada's always talking about Krishna consciousness. Consciousness. When the consciousness is correct, the mentality is correct. Then we yeah. realize that there is nothing to be done. That the, then the Lord's grace becomes irresistible and causeless. Yeah. Why is it causeless? There cannot be any cause for it. We cannot exactly. cause it. That's why it's causeless. So people exactly. have this weird people have this weird idea. If you if you you know people you, you hear people talk all the time. They say, "Oh, causeless grace and causeless cause." They have no idea what causeless, causeless means. Yeah. Causeless means it cannot have a cause. Exactly. Not that it doesn't. Not just that it doesn't have a cause. Not just that, oh. God showered his causeless grace on, on this person or that person. He just did it out of his own free will or something like that. No, there is no cause to grace. There is no mm-hmm. cause to grace. Grace cannot be caused. Mm-hmm. So really, when we say causeless grace, we just mean grace. But we say causeless grace because people have this wrong idea of cause grace. Yeah. There is no cause grace. There is no cause grace. There is no mm-hmm. cause grace. Grace cannot be caused by yeah. us. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. So, so the thing is, these people have not thought deeply about this. The northern, the, what it was Vedanta Deshika. Okay, admittedly, Vedanta Deshika had his reasons because he's fighting against the Mayavadis and the and the Advaitins mm-hmm. and everybody of the Beta Vedans, whatever, who have these even even stranger ideas. Right, and he's trying to use the Sanskrit scriptures and the Vedas and everything to, to, to beat them again. But here, the essence is being gotten at by the by by Manavala Mamuni and, and Pila Lokacharya, getting at the real essence of the crux of the matter. What is the crux of the matter? The real crux of the matter is that there is no way that you can cause your own liberation. In any way, shape, or form, even minutely, you cannot, you have no way of doing that like that. And if you think even property, if you think, oh no, well, property is the way like that, so therefore I must do property. No, no, it's nothing that you must do. You can't do it, right? You just have to realize it. You just have to realize your position. Realize the position you're in, that's it. Then the grace will be causeless as it always is. Causes grace, and it will be irresistible. You cannot fight it. Yeah, and, it's, and it was put in a very nice way in that sutra that um, by um, Manaval Mahamunigal that I think Dr. Alwal said that um, basically, if you don't realize this, then everything you do is a waste of time. And only if you re- it, it's actually sinful. It's actually sinful. Everything that you do and only when you realize this that everything becomes perfect. <laughs> people, 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 people go out of their brains. People go, people go completely crazy when you try to tell them that you're doing bhakti yoga, karma yoga, jnana yoga, and Lord has told you to do this in the scriptures, and, but, but, but they're actually sinful things that you're doing. The, the, yeah. that's, what, that's, that's what the Tengala see it. They see these other replies as actually being sinful. Yes. Right? Because, and, the, and the reason when you say that to people is because they don't understand that you're not decrying karma, jnana, or bhakti. You're not mm-hmm. saying don't work, don't study, don't do acts of devotion. You're not saying that. We do those things, but we have to give up the idea that we're the ones doing them for our benefit, right? Which is very, very much like what the, as, as the, what the, the what do I do when they do the Satya they're saying, I'm not doing this. God's doing this for his own purpose, through me, like that. I'm not doing it, and I'm not receiving any benefit for him. It's all going for him. He's doing it it's for him. As, as uh, Turin Ryan said when we chanted Vishnu Sashman on the other night, you know, he did the Satvika Tyaga. It's not for his birthday that we chanted Vishnu Sashman. We're chanting Vishnu Sashman. It's God chanting Vishnu Sashman through us for God's own pleasure. pleasure. That's all. Yeah. That's all. And, and all the benefit occurs to him for doing it. Like that, um, so so uh, that's why I'm not I'm not at all opposed to the to the uh, Satvika Tyaga that the that the that the do. And Dr. Alwa mentioned he was very surprised when he read 
uh, uh, Ramanuja's Niti Granta. In Niti Granta, Raman, Ramanuja suggests to do the Sattvika Tyaga Mantras. We should probably do the Sattvika Tyaga Mantras. Probably. I don't know why, and I still don't know why the Tengalais don't do them, right? They normally don't do those Sattvika Tyagas. Maybe it's because, and uh, somebody may have said this to me, that because we realize those things, we're thinking like that. We're not thinking that our effort is doing something. So whereas the tingle, the modigalites have to keep saying it because they are the ones who believe in in cause grace. They're the ones who believe in effort, right? Mm -hmm. So they're the ones who always have to keep saying, no, no, it's not our effort. It's not our effort. It's his, like that. Whereas we don't have to do it because our basic understanding is it's not our effort. Yeah. So why why do we have to mention it specifically? So that's that's the only reason I can I can think of. But I, there's nothing. There should be nothing against doing it. At the same time, mm -hmm. at the same time, there's no necessity to do anything, right? Yeah. The realization is only the, is is only needed. So the realization that we're not the realization that, but you know, when we check, when we say something out loud and we think about it, then the realization comes to us. It's a reminder of the re, it's a reminder. Just like when we say the Dwaya mantra, the first part of the Dwaya mantra, we're reminded of the property that we did. So we're not surrendering again when we do the Dwaya mantra. The surrender is done only one time, but we're reminded of the surrender that we did. And similarly, with the Satvikatyaga mantra, it reminds us. It just reminds us. It's a friendly reminder that we're not doing anything. God's doing everything through us and for his own benefit. So I don't see anything wrong with it. I'm not against it at all. And Ramanuja puts it in his Pitsu Granta. And if you want to do it, you can do it. If you don't want to do it, also, you don't have to do it. If you have the realization that he's, that he's working through you, then why say it? There's no need. Yeah, I was I was thinking about that, and <clears throat> because the whole point of meditating and the dwayam, as we, we discussed before, is to remember the point of when we did property. But now I was thinking that from what you said earlier, that actually it's meditation and the point of when we realized it. Because we didn't do property even. If you if you really analyze it, yeah, deeper, we didn't do it. We didn't even it, do property. It's it's a, yeah. The first part of the the first part of the diamond. Second part is about, of course, the part of the pay the goal. Okay. But the first part yeah. is about the means, and therefore it's a remembrance. Okay, I said it was a remembrance of the time we did property, but actually it's just a remembrance of, as you say, as the realization. And in the fact, that's the thing. After studying all these things, I mean, I you know when I started to study about property and everything like that, I started reading and reading and reading and reading. And, and, and just one day it hit me. It yes. was a realization. It just hits you one day and you get it. Yes. And the day before yes. you didn't get it. You just didn't get it before. You, you were thinking, oh, I have to do something. Have to. And then all of a sudden you get it. You get it that it's just a realization and it's not something that you actually have to do. And then when people give you all these you know, ridiculous arguments that, oh, no, but now you have to do this and you have to go there or you have to do that again because you didn't do that correctly or you want, you know, like, then that all becomes meaningless to you and you just realize that, you were, that you're already there and then you just go along with, you know, whatever, you just go along to get along, you know, like you're, you know, like when I was in Sri Rangam and, and uh, you know, they say, oh, you know, but we think you should do this or that or that, blah, blah, blah. Okay. But I know that, you know, I know that I'm fine. I know that I'm already surrendered, you know, that, yeah. that, that I realized that. Really that exactly. I, I realized that, I realized that, you know, a long time before I did anything externally, you know. But, you yeah. know, people, people like you to go through the external motions and, and, and do that. So that's fine. That's the interesting thing also is that, you know, certain schools of Vaishnavism, they really, really stress upon having to give up false ego having to give up the ahankara but really truly this realization is the ultimate destruction of the ahankara it, yeah. it really is once you've understood that and you just that that's it the ahankara is done you know you you understand that you're god's slave you the sheshatwa and that you totally depend on him then how what, where again do you have a hankara? They, they, they can't be any hankara existing. Whereas you have to go through so much effort of going through a process of maybe chanting a mantra and thinking by chanting that mantra, I am now going to give up the hankara, which doesn't happen unless you even get that realization. So it's amazing, you know. 
you know, people, it, you know, as I as we pointed out with that Sanskrit sloka about about the Vidhi and the Anavad, you know, that explain people don't even know people even don't even know how to do Achmana. They don't even know how to worship a deity. Before. They they don't know they have to wash their feet before Achmana. They don't know that they have to take a bath before doing puja. They don't know that they have to you know they have to do this before doing that. They don't know that like that. So here it's very very clear. It's becoming very very clear. Right in the Charma Sloka, what is the clear thing to get back to the Charma Sloka, which is what we're starting to talk about? Sarva Dharma Pritija, right in the first line, it says, You have yeah. to abandon all these other self uh, ideas of self effort, even the self, even if you have this idea that, that your self effort is property. Yeah, that has to be abandoned. Abandon all yeah. ideas of self effort. You are a kitten, just lay there, mother cat will pick you up. <laughs> that's it that's it that's it abandon all varieties of self-effort to the goal right then you can then the surrender then i will become the upaya then the lord will become the upaya for you yeah like yeah. that only after you do that only after you after you give that give that up like that and then you actually feel that that sense of freedom that you never felt before ever it, it, it's amazing yeah before as long as as, long, as yeah as long as see as long as there's some prerequisite as long as there's some effort that you have to make you're going to fall short mm. doesn't matter it doesn't matter even how and some people are going to criticize you oh yeah you didn't do this or you didn't do that or you know we do we really know what you feel in your heart you know uh, you know are you really surrendered you know, people are, you know, people play these mind games with each other and they say, and they just go on and on and on and on. And it's just all one upmanship. No, we did it like this. You have to do this. You have to do that. You have to do the other. Oh, we believe that you have to do that. Right? Oh, no, no, no. Not only that, but you have to do even more. You have to do that. So it's all one upmanship. It's all, it's all mind games on each other about how to surrender like that. This cuts all of that out of there. None of that is there because it's not up to you. It isn't up to you. It's mm -hmm. not up to you. The Lord is looking for an excuse to save you, right? He's very merciful. He's looking for an excuse to save you, right? All you have to do is come to that realization, that realization of who you really are, that you really are his property, and that's it. That's all there is to it, like that. And then people, it, it's, but it goes on and on and on. People just, they, they try to find fault with this system, Again and again and again. They say, well, you know, okay, who are you, who are you to say that you perfectly think that you are, that you've given up a hunkar, that you've given up a that you really think that you're a, 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 it doesn't matter. Doesn't yeah. matter. Doesn't matter. Even if the kitten fights against the mother cat, the mother cat's going to pick it up and save it. Yeah. So, so try or don't try or whatever you do, doesn't matter. You're safe. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. That's why I said a really expert lifeguard, a really good lifeguard, he can even save a person who's struggling, who's hysterical, who's, who's completely panicked in the water. Good mm -hmm. lifeguard can save him. And that's, uh, I'll just give you an example quickly. When I did my rescue diver um, certification, okay, they have a thing in rescue, they teach you all the techniques. And then what they do is that the instructor, the guy who knows all the techniques better than you, he knows them all the, so well that he's the one who's teaching you, right? He goes out there in the water and he says, okay, I'm going to panic. I'm going to panic. I'm going to show you what it's like. And you have to save me, even though I'm panicking. This guy is maybe 10 times bigger than you, you know, everything like that. And then you have to uh, try to approach and grab that guy and, and get him and save him. Like that. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do it exactly in the right way that he's taught you, I mean, I've, I've seen people and I've personally tried and the guy rips your mask off, pushes you away, pushes you underwater, pulls your regulator out of your mouth, you can't breathe and tries to drown you on purpose because mm -hmm. he's teaching you to be able to save people. So he mm -hmm. is really putting you through a hell you know, at the end of this thing. But if you learn how to overcome all of that, then you become a really first-class rescuer. 
you know, and that's the point of the, of, of the thing. So a really first class rescuer and God is the, the greatest. He has the best. He is the most, he is, he's the most qualified to rescue us. He is in fact, the only one who can rescue us like that. He is able to do that. He is able to save us even if we don't want to be saved. Mm -hmm. Even against our will, even so that's that's the thing with the, the the mother monkey. If the baby monkey doesn't want to hang on, nothing she can do about it. But the mo the mother cat, the, if the baby struggles, she can still take him, still take mm. him, like that. So that's why these these analogies are important. That they give us an idea of the situation that we're in. What is the situation that we're in? The situation that we're in is we're helpless, like the baby kitten. We're totally helpless. Totally helpless. And sometimes we panic, and, and but still God is going to save us like that. So that's why the Rama Charma Soka is very important because um, Rama says Sakrideva. Sakrideva, once mm -hmm. only. Once only. You have to come to that realization. So that's the thing that they always say, oh, yeah, yeah, maybe when you were initiated or, or that time when you did this, you were a little bit surrendered or something like that, but you didn't maintain that. You, you, you gave it all up and you left and you, now, you're, now you're doing your own thing and you've got some ego and you, this, that, and the other. So you're, you're not going to make it because, because you didn't maintain that mentality. You have to always maintain that perfect mentality that you are, that you are God's, uh, you know, you are the property of God and you're completely surrendered to God. And, and we, can see, we can see that you have false ego now and you've given it up and now you believe this and that and the other. Like that, so you we don't we don't accept that you're a surrendered person and that God's going to save you, right? No, that's not right. Rama says once only, Sakrideva, once only, come to that realization. In this material world, we can lose this realization, we can lose this this knowledge instantly. You know, I mean, it's po it's possible it's possible we can be deluded at any point in this material world until we go there until we're actually in Sri Vaikuntam completely freed from ignorance, right? At any moment, we've seen people who have fallen into ignorant, ignorant understandings or ignorant actions even, right? In this material world, at any moment, right? We can, uh, that can happen. But does it mean that there's, they're no longer saved? No, it doesn't because, and as Lord, uh, even uh, what Lord Vraha said, you know, they may be in a coma. They may be completely unable to think Unable to realize that they're who they are and what they are, their, their real nature, right? But the, the Lord saves them. He, aham smarami madbakta. The Lord will remember you. The Lord will remember you. You didn't remember the Lord. You forgot about the Lord. He will remember you. So these other, other, these other charma sokas are very, very important. Very, very important too. But they, they, we don't find so much being written about them. Right now, Vedantadesh is written by a Pradhana Saram. He's written a, a book about the Rama Charma Sloka, And he's also written a book about the Vraha Charma Sloka, And I hope that we go through those too. And I would like to see if the, if the Tengalaya Acharyas have written about them too. So I, that, and, and if they haven't, I would like to go into them and I would like to try and understand them also in very much detail, like we're understanding the Charma Sloka of Lord Krishna here. Um, so, so these are... These are all things which I which I would like to do. I don't know if I don't know if all this literature exists, but whatever exists, right, we should go through it. And if it doesn't exist, we should think about it very deeply, and we should try and preach about it. Because I I really feel that that a lot of these other Vaishnavas who read Bhagavad Gita, they're missing the boat. They're missing the the whole idea of when they read when when they read the Bhagavad Gita when they get to the Charma Sloka, everybody thinks it's an important sloka. But nobody mm -hmm. knows how important it is. It's so important mm -hmm. you could take the rest of the Gita and throw it away. Yeah. Gita, it, the Gita, as I said in the beginning, is such an important scripture. The Mahabharata is the fifth Veda. The Gita is the essence of the Upanishads, right? The Gita is such a great thing. Even Gita Arta Sangraha is a condensation of the Gita. The Gita is such a great thing. But the essence of the Gita is what? Is that one verse. And, and, even with that one verse, if you throw the rest, if you lost the rest of the Gita and you just had that one verse, that one verse is the most important thing. 
So similarly, the, the same thing with the Ramayana, that one verse that, that Rama says, the same thing with Lord Varaha, his, his ultimate instructions. These things are the most important things. And let's face it, these days, people, everybody wants everything quick. Nobody wants to spend time on anything. Get right to the point. Get right to the essence of something. We don't have time to read the 700 slokas of Bhagavad Gita. We want it in short. Okay, there's one verse. There's one verse. But that mm -hmm. one verse, again, like a sutra, has to be explained, and that elaboration takes time and takes explanation. So I want to hear more explanation about the other Charma Slokas of Rama and, and, and Varaha also, because I, I know that we'll get – this is what I, I tell other Vaishnavas who talk about the Charma Sloka or talk about Krishna Charma Sloka. They talk about Sarvanama Purtija. They preach about it. But they don't truly understand it because they don't see it. Has, it has to equal – it has to be in equal in meaning to these other verses of Raha and Rama. So mm -hmm. their idea, their, 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 in context, their idea, when they interpret surrender to Krishna as being lifelong, eternal, you know, uh, constant surrender, that doesn't click with the Ramacharma Sloka. Ramacharma Sloka says once only. Once only means you do it at a particular mm -hmm. time and then you don't do it. Exactly. The, the, yeah. You know, uh, uh, Vraha says, at the time of death, if you don't remember me, I, I remember you. Yeah. Yeah. So, so these yeah. are all things which help us to understand Ch uh, Krishna Charma Sloka. Otherwise, if we yeah. could just understand Krishna Charma Sloka by itself, then, then everybody would understand it the same way the Sri Vaishnavas do. But they don't, mm -hmm. and because they don't, they need. They need explanation of it, and they need explanation of the other charma slokas to understand it. And, we, and they, mm. they, um, they, they are adjectival to it. They, they help us to explain it. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the thing that people, people so many times they say, yes, I understand Bhagavad Gita. I understand the, the, I understand the charma sloka of Bhagavad Gita. But they say, but they say no, no, we don't accept the Brahma charma sloka of Rama charma sloka. Why should we accept that? That's that's Sri Vaishnava thing, you no, know, like that. No, no, but it has to be accepted. Why? Why? Why is it? It's just that there's no emphasis. There's no emphasis. You know, sometimes when people put an emphasis on one thing, they miss. They they look at the tree, but they miss. They miss the forest. You know. So by 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 emphasizing the the only the Bhagavad Gita or only the Krishna Chama Soka, they miss all the other things. It has to be. We can't reject the rest of the scriptures. We can't reject the Vedas. We can't reject the Ramayana. We can't reject the, the Sapphic of Puranas, right? And just take one verse from the Gita and base everything on that. Because our, our understanding of it will, will, is enhanced by the understanding of all these other scriptures. So, yeah. you know, it's like the, it's like the same thing the Gaudiyas do with, the, with their idea of uh, Krishna Stubhava and Swayam Sloka. It means this, but in context, mm -hmm. it doesn't mean that. They say it means right. this, right? But in context of the of the of the of the chapter and of the whole book, it doesn't mean that, you know. So they emphasize something because they like to emphasize something, or it's their idea that this is more important. But if you look at it in the whole scheme of things, it doesn't. Uh, that doesn't. In context, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that. It's like that. So that's very important too. Context is so important when understanding these things. So although it stands out by itself as a final instruction, still we have to understand it with all these other scriptures and all these other, even the whole rest of the Bhagavad Gita, we have to understand it in that context. Yeah. So we're, we're getting to an expanded understanding here. So you can see how we've, we've, we've talked about the first part of the, of the, uh, of the Charma Sloka as being uh, so much expans expansive of the of the um, what do you call it the uh, the first part of the Dwaya mantra and the Astaksha mantra also. Mm 